I want to call this meeting to order. And we'll start by the introduction of commissioners and staff, starting on my left. Aaron Ryder, Columbus. Bill Escarino, Garden City. Gerald Lauber from Topeka. Lauren Quayle Sill, Hutchison. Emmerich Cross, Kansas City. Warren Gefeller, Russell. Okay, is Warren on? Yeah, I'm on. Uh, yeah, I'm not hearing anything. He's muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I hear you. Okay. Troy Spore, okay. Russell, Kansas. Troy is there too. Troy there. He was there. I think Troy already spoke, but I think they both overspoke each other. Troy Spore, Oakley, Kansas. Sheila Camus, Commission Support. It's Nixon Commission Support. Dan Riley, Chief Counsel. Okay, that's what we have so far here. I think Brad will be along <laughs> shortly. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the minutes? The agenda, there's no changes. I, I, I made the agenda. No changes. No changes in the agenda. Do we have any deletion or any corrections to the minutes? Do you want to move both or do you want to move? Yeah, let's go ahead separate. and move. If nobody has any objection, we'll go ahead and move both the April and the May minutes. Okay. Move to accept. But second. I guess, I've got a second. All those favor say aye. 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 Okay. At this point in time, we recognize and encourage any general public comment on non-agenda items. Uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to discuss today that's not going to be on the agenda? Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Tim Nettle. I live in Scranton, which is in Osage County. I have two real quick questions. Um, I visited Osage County Fishing Lake uh, two weeks ago, and I visited Pomona State Lake this last week. Um, Pomona primarily is overrun with Ceresa lespediza. I'm just curious if there are any plans of getting spraying the noxious weeds, or or who do I contact in order to? Go ahead. Sure. Brad Lovell, Secretary. Uh, so what we could do, Tim, is get with you and find out specifically where you're looking at and get with our, whether it's parks or public lands or where the ground is exactly. And with specifics, we can visit with you about that. Yeah, you know, Obviously, it's, it's a priority for us to deal with Cerise and, and, uh, and yeah, we're interested in, in what you're observing. Yeah, I didn't know if I needed to go to Pomona State Park and talk to the guys there. You can. That's a that's a I good mean, that's way to do to it. Me. it. It could be it could be on our public lands. Is it in the park? You, you're pretty confident. Yo, know, by the boat ramps and. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you can start that. You know where the park office is. Sure. There. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. glad to. Thank you. And the second question: A year ago this month, the Supreme Court made a ruling, six to three, that a state cannot give a third party permission to trespass onto private lands. I contacted Pratt, uh, had correspondence with Nadia. The reply that I got back that from, the, she said, legal counsel for Wildlife and Parks, that this does not affect Kansas. State statute 321013 section C says a licensed hunter can pursue wounded wildlife on private property without asking permission. If you, the Supreme Court ruled that this is a violation of a property owner's Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment rights because we're not being justly compensated for somebody coming onto our land. So I was just curious. I didn't. It was just that the counsel or the legal counsel said it didn't affect Kansas. I don't know if we had anything to add to that, please. Well, I, it it wasn't me, um, so I'm not familiar with the answer or the question. Was that the United States Supreme Court? U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. Last um, summer. 
let me get your contact information and I'll, I'll have to do some, some checking because I'm not familiar with that opinion. So I'll, I'll okay. do so and get back to you if that's okay. okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other public comment on non-agenda items? Well, I don't know what your agenda is, but my question is uh, keeping Blue Cat, like for example, from Perry, that aren't over 35 inches, for example, I was fishing there last summer with the guy and we got 13 blue cat in a few hours and from five to 13 pounds. And I was wondering if there's any chance they'll ever like let you keep one under 35. Well, the odds are yes, but maybe um, Mr. Rinky, is he, do you have, would you have something to add to that? <clears throat> Sir, can I get your name, please? My name? Yes. Uh, Frank Klein. I live in Douglas County. Frank Klein? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Ranke, um, Northeast Region Fisheries Supervisor. And we have a lot of lakes, and Perry's one of them that's really close to coming off the standard 35 inch minimum that we. Uh, apply as soon as the, the reservoirs are have the blue cats in there to protect them till we have enough brood stock in the lake where they're spawning successfully and self-reproducing the lakes in the in the lake so we don't have to st continue stocking them and perry's one of them melvin's close to and so is clinton to uh, opening those up to more harvest we just did it this year out at uh Tuttle Creek, and, and we monitor those populations every year. Matter of fact, our biologists are out there doing that right now with electric fishing boats. So uh, we collect that data throughout the year, analyze it in the fall, and then uh, present the recommendations for changes here at the commission. So we're, we're looking at it closely. I can't say what year it'll be. It could be next year. It still could be a couple of years down the road, but okay. yep. And my other question or concern is like, I was at Marion Reservoir a couple weeks ago, catching crappie and walked up on this guy and said, oh yeah, I've got 17 crappie. Well, there wasn't two that were over 10 inches. It's very, very small. And he's harvesting thousands of them out there. So uh, in my opinion, they need to be 10 inches. And then my other concern is how many crappie are being harvested by this new technology. I know two guys that went to Milford and caught 96 crappie, kept every one of them. So, so wondered about that too. Mr. Thank Chair, you. we have the benefit of having um, Brian Sowards, our, our fishery director here. Brian, you want to comment? Yeah, if, if the chairman wants. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> The, uh, the, the crappie situation is not necessarily um, new to us. In the last few years, this technology, the pan optics, live scope, active target, there's different things that came on that and came on that and, and, and there has been a lot of concern from the public, uh, similar to yourself. And so the department, our, our research and survey officer in Emporia has taken on some, some research projects looking just, just at those technologies and and looking at harvest rates of crappie in particular. And um, we're also looking at blue cats with it this summer. I think this summer or, or next, we're looking at how that technology might impact catch rates of blue cats as well. So um, the preliminary information was, um, it, it really depends on your experience with the equipment, but, but active target or, or live scope technology and traditional fishing didn't differ that much, at least in the research that we did. We, we are aware that there are some out there that are really good with that technology that can that can catch a lot of crappie, but we just haven't been able to discern uh, population level impacts yet. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Yep. Uh, are there any other comments from the public on non-agenda items? Any from the audience? <coughs> Nope, not that I can see. All right. Well, then let's move on. Let's start with the department report and uh, Secretary Loveless. Thank you, Chairman Lauber, members of the commission. Um, fiscal status, um, 
The governor's budget recommendations for our agency were passed largely unchanged, so we were pleased about that. Um, the approved fiscal year budget for 2023 is, is just under 100 million, um, 97.8 million for all of our divisions and, and collective efforts. Um, in addition, the legislature did pass uh, the governor's request at a 5% salary increase for uh, state employees that are not part of a defined pay plan. Um, this affected uh, or, or benefited uh, uh, the majority of agency employees, but some law enforcement officers who um, are on, on a pay schedule uh, were excluded from that increase. Um, so currently, I guess I would add that we're looking at law enforcement as well as some other divisions about uh, comparing their current pay to pay of our their peers in our neighboring states um, uh, because we believe we're low and uh, we want to be competitive and and compensate our folks as best we're able. And so we're working with human resources and department of administration to evaluate those pay grades and and see if if we can upgrade those. Uh, as far as park fee fund, at the end of May, um, the park fee fund was at uh, 11 million, uh, 139,000 or about 11% decrease over last year. However, compared to the long-term average, um, we're still higher. So last year was, um, we benefited from that COVID bump that we've talked about a lot, um, but we're still better than the long-term average. So. Our, our parks are doing really well, accommodating more people uh, and receiving more revenue than we have for the, for the long term. Uh, cabin revenue um, through the end of May was 1.32 million or about 16% less than a year ago, but again, higher than the long-term average. Wildlife fee fund that so many of our divisions depend on, um, this has declined um, from fiscal year 21, uh, about 28%. Uh, they, those receipts are similar to that, that five-year average in terms of um, uh, wildlife fee fund status. Through May, our total annual receipts are 29.3 million. And um, the balance in the wildlife fee fund at the end of May was uh, just over 30 million, so very healthy. Uh, the boat, boating fee fund uh, is what we use to provide um, safety, education, and access infrastructure to protect and support the boating public. Year to date, our receipts are uh, 1.116 million. Um, that's less than last year's, uh, but again, above the long term average. Um, we are right now, this is end of fiscal year, so we're wrapping up. Uh, fiscal year 2022 and preparing for the start of fiscal year 2023 on July 1st. Um, the capital improvement requests for fiscal year 24 are being finalized and we'll work on those in the next coming months and present those in the fall. Um, the one concern that, that we should notify you about is uh, the impact on inflation on the agency budget and our field operations. Um, the increase in fuel prices has had a big impact on us. The other thing that um, if you've done any construction the last few years, you're aware um, of what we're facing when we budget for facilities that are needed. Uh, we got a bit a year ago. Um, that's not even uh, applicable now. Things are increasing so much that it's very hard for us to, to get bids, get, get allocations, project to the legislature what we want to build and spend. And, and if that's delayed by a couple of years, then the numbers are no longer meaningful. So it's a real challenge for us to keep up with that. And what our managers are having to do is project for X number of, of buildings, for instance, uh, at our facilities. And when the time comes, it might be X minus, you know, 40% that we can actually afford to, to pay for based on what we originally projected and budgeted and we're bid. So a, a very much a moving target that we're dealing with. Our folks are coping with that, but it's uh, creating a lot of work for, for us just to keep up with that. And engineering um, has been in the middle of that process and they're uh, struggling to hold 
bids and contractors to be accountable when we know that their costs are changing too and we don't want to be unfair to them. So it's a challenging time for us mm -hmm. when it comes to running the, the, the divisions. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Okay, are there any questions for Brad? Yes, I have a question for Brad. So, so the money that is set aside for uh, the budget for uh, building and those types of things, if if those bids come in over cost and we do not do those projects, are you able to carry that over to the next year or does that go away in in this year for? Oftentimes we, we, we are, are able to keep that for a few years, but every year we're having to Held. roll items along that we weren't able to complete. And, and so we go to the legislature and say, we need this appropriation to spend this amount of money. And then we, we revise that each year for the, for the upcoming year based on what we were able to complete and what was uncompleted. And so that's a constantly a, a, a changing target, but we go to the legislature uh, to, to upgrade that and um, every year. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Brad? Okay, Dan, legislative update. Thank you, Mr. Chair, commissioners. Um, as you all recall, one of the pieces of legislation that came out of the last session was House Bill 2476. And that's the bill that authorized us to uh, establish some distinctive license plates um, as a fundraiser and a way for people to be able to, to uh, present their support for wildlife and parks. Jason, would you pull those images up for me? We showed you the images of the, of the design versions uh, that we had initially and, and what we kind of represented the, the project with. And since the time of uh, showing you those images, we've had contact with the Department of Revenue, which is the agency that's responsible for the oversight of the all the distinctive tags that are produced in Kansas since they deal with licensing motor vehicles. Uh, what we have learned is that we, and the, the folks at Revenue even talked about how great and graphic and beautiful our tags are. Unfortunately, our designs did not pass the clarity test because what they do as the initial part of the process is take uh, prospective distinctive tags out and run them through law enforcement review to find out because basically the purpose of a tag is to be able to identify a vehicle. So the, the color combinations have to meet the clarity standards. And unfortunately, our tags as designed do not. So that's that's not an endpoint. That's not a that's not a wall. That's just a hurdle. So what we're going to have to do is is take the guidance from revenue, basically, and they're going to send us a book with examples, but basically as they describe it, most of the distinctive tags have got a light colored, so, fairly solid background that doesn't conflict with the black letters and numbers because the standard color, the only color that the tags can be printed in in terms of the numbers and letters are black. Um, that example with the white down there looks great. And in fact, that was the only one that passed the clarity test, but you can't get white numbers and letters. So that one was kind of an albatross to begin with. But, <laughs> So, so what we're going to have to do is basically re redesign the backgrounds so they don't conflict with the, the black numbers and letters. The one thing that we can do is retain the graphic, you know, the, the chickadee, the buck, uh, the bass, although the bass is probably going to have to be smaller and lighter colored because that's part of the problem in terms of the distinction there. Um, does that mean I talk too long, Jason? No. <laughs> the timer, another issue coming up that we the had. The timer already. went off. No. Okay. Um, so, so we're going to have to rework the background. The one thing that I did find out that is up to our discretion is the color for the, the other lettering on the plate. The Kansas at the top can be a color of our choosing. Um, and also the lettering at the, on the bottom can be a, a color of our choosing. So if, if uh, and I even asked about blaze orange because that's the first color, you know, if, if highly visible is, is one of the criteria, you know, that's, that's obviously a color that we like and we're used to. So 
Um, but anyway, we, we've got some redesign process to go through with that. They're going to uh, provide us with a criteria of the requirements that we have to meet to, to move this project on to the next phase because we don't have that list at this point. Uh, basically, what we have at this point is legislative approval. Um, also, the tags as approved by the legislature are only going to be for passenger class vehicles. We're not going to have a tag that's appropriate for an RV or a trailer. So the park passport is still going to have to be very much in existence. You know, for those categories of vehicles, we will not have a, a, a specialized tag that, that is suitable for them. And also we'll have to have the park passport, obviously for people that don't choose to buy one of these tags. But um, we should, we design in, in all issues aside, we shouldn't have any problem having these tags ready to roll out by January, which would be the first date when they're available anyway. Um, but we do have some additional work to do at this point uh, as far as, as the, the design and, and those factors go. Does anybody have any questions on that? The other bill that I wanted to talk to you about uh, today is another house bill and that's 2087. And I left a copy for you up there on the commissioner's table. Um, that's a bill that, that passed this session also that kind of does a rework on the regulation promulgation process. And um, it's a little bit difficult to characterize the, the kind of atmosphere there is between the legislature and the regulatory process right now, because um, at times I would say it's very hot and other times I would say it's very cold, um, but there's definitely friction between those two phases of government at this point. You can see from this bill, um, which in part restructures the, the process of review. It, it realigns the order of review, which all, by all uh, expectations is probably gonna be a beneficial thing. But one thing that it also does is creates a requirement for a five-year review and report by every agency to justify every regulation that they have before with the committee on, on joint, the Joint Committee on Rules and Regs. So basically they've created a requirement where every agency will be required to appear and explain why each one of their regulations should not be revoked, um, which is, is kind of a drastic major. And you know, if, if you're a fan of the separation of powers doctrine like I am, it, it kind of seems to, to cut the corners in terms of the separation between the administration of executive agencies and the legislation and legislators. Something else that, that's coming up in November is a ballot initiative that you're probably aware of also. Um, that ballot initiative would authorize the legislature to revoke or suspend any executive agency's rules and regulations by a simple majority vote. So the business of promulgating regulations or, or deciding those issues in terms of how to best administer the business of an agency would be completely taken out of the hands of the agency because that provision would give the legislature the ability to revoke anything without any agency involvement. Um, and it's, it's kind of startling when you think about the potential consequences. Uh, the immediate consequences in terms of, of our operation from House Bill 2087 was to kind of gnarl up the whole mess. And part of that's due to the fact that anytime you have a major procedural changeover, retooling something, it, it takes people a while to kind of get up to speed and figure out the level and the roles of everybody in the process. The immediate impact on us were that nine regs that we'd had submitted to the process in April and the change took place in May. That's when the, the new reg process was, was implemented. We'd submitted nine regs in April, which were basically kicked back out of the process when they restarted the new process, um, kind of contrary to what they had indicated would take place. And since that time, 
the process has been kind of a gnarled up mess just because everybody's trying to figure out exactly how the new scheme is, is going to work. And those regs that had been started in April are still in the process. And you are all very familiar with how dependent we are on the ability to, to change our regulations as needed to make, to make the adjustments that we have to um, off times on an annual basis. So it's, it's critical to us how well the promulgation process functions and our ability to get information in there and regulation changes out of there. So it's, it's been kind of a, like I say, I would best characterize it as kind of a gnarled up mess at this point. Um, hopefully the, the immediate impacts are something that are gonna kind of dissolve and fade out as people get accustomed to the changes. So I think that we'll get back to something resembling what the, what the prior status in, in terms of timeframes were. Although it's always been a slow and frustrating process to promulgate a reg, that's nothing new. It's, it's always taken a lot more time than it seems like it should. But these potential changes, um, some, some may be occurring based on that November vote or the fact that we are going to be called to, to basically defend and justify every regulation we have at a point in time that's already been established by the by that uh, House Bill 2087 is, is kind of a kind of a harsh reality in terms of the process. And uh, I'm not sure just exactly where the where the angst and the friction have all come from. I think some of it was really intensified by some of the public health issues that ended up stuck between an administrative agency and the legislature. And I think that has kind of fueled some of the attack that's, that's taken place here as far as the, the assault on, on uh, an agency's ability to promulgate their own regulations. And some of that hostility has definitely spilled over into that review committee, the joint committee that, that we have to appear before with every set of regulations. So it, it's not that the legislature hasn't had access to the process in terms of uh, comment or, or some impact on regulations you know, with the prior procedure, uh, but definitely the ability to revoke or suspend any regulation without any involvement of the agency is, is a pretty bold step further than they've ever been before. Is that gonna require a simple majority or a super majority? I thought I read that it was a super majority. I don't believe so. I think it's a simple majority. I think it's a simple. Um, and that, that one is on the November ballot. Assuming this passes, I'm assuming we're probably going to have to have a person or persons preparing a template format to be able to make this presentation every five years. Now, is it five years and you don't have to do anything, or is it a certain amount of regulations each year for five years? I think the way it appears to me in the statute, and, and we are projected to be basically five years out from this time. So our, our time is not gonna come up just because of where we are in terms of the agency numbering system. Um, but the way I read it, every five years, the, the schedule will roll over. So those agencies will basically be required to start at the top and go to the bottom and provide justification to that committee why that each one of those individual regulations should not be revoked. But during any time the legislature's in session, they can pass a vote on a, a, a no vote or a cancel a deer raid or something. If, if that initiative passes. On, under, under the current law that's already passed, the House Bill 2087, we will be required to go before that committee in five years and justify the existence of every regulation. But if we have. the initiative passes. They, they can do it on any schedule, any on a whim, yeah. Yeah, without any prior notice uh, and, and without any involvement of anybody outside of the legislature. And one of the things that kind of surprises me, I haven't, you know, you, you see advertisements or, or politicking um, related to constitutional 
uh, initiatives. You know, it's not unusual to see that. I haven't seen anything about this one. I haven't seen any mention opposed or, or in favor at all, which, which is kind of troubling to me also. Um, and I can honestly tell you that, that, that the legislative action already has had an impact on the, the agencies that are involved in the review process. The, those people have, have, have heard the shots go over their heads. And I think that's also part of the reason why the process has, has ground down to a, an even slower moving thing than it was before, because I think they are, are absolutely double crossing all the T's and, and dotting the I's because I think they have been, I think they've received something in the form of at least a veiled threat from the legislature in terms of the overview of the process. And, and I mean, the integrity of the reg promulgation process, I think is probably one of the highest standards in terms of, of state government. I mean, that, that process has always been very thorough. I mean, if, if you look at the scrutiny a regulation goes through before it actually becomes part of the law, it's a lot higher than anything that a statute ever goes through. You know, statutes are basically an idea that gets thrown in front of the committee and may walk out as law. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the, yeah, this is, I speak on behalf of Dan Riley. This is not on, this is not on, based on, on behalf of Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Yeah. My comments are my own. But, but regulations are highly scrutinized. You know, they, they, they are, are reviewed and they are fine filtered and they are reviewed again. Um, from every aspect. So, I mean, the scrutiny has always been there in terms of the regulations. So it's a little bit disingenuous to kind of cast out on the system. Okay. So, Lauren, do you have a question? Where will the public education come from prior to that November election? There's a lot of state agencies this affects, but I mean, this is going to sound like kind of boring, benign stuff to the general public but it's a big deal. Oh yeah. How do we, how, where does that public education come from? I don't know, because if you think about it, the, the agencies that probably would have the biggest stake in all of this are also subject to the whims of the legislature. Uh, it's like it, it almost in fear of speaking up because the ability to, to pay the price for that may be, you know, so I, I honestly don't have a good answer for that. Brad, comment. Brad Love, the secretary. So I appreciate your comment, um, Commissioner. Um, we can't lobby, obviously, uh, on our own behalf, but we do make every effort to educate our stakeholders. We have a lot of interested stakeholders who are are want to help the agency be able to uh, function efficiently, right? And you heard from Dan's comments. This could really change the way we're able to function and change the way our regulations that have very thoughtfully been considered with input from the public and, and uh, a final decision by the commission could cause them to change just very quickly during the legislature. So one thing we can do and probably should do to your comment is reach out to our stakeholders and let them know this is coming up on a ballot. Here's the information, not arguing one way or the other, but here's how this will impact the agency. If it, if it passes, just so we educate people. So that would be very appropriate. I appreciate you bringing that up. Any other questions for Dan or Secretary Loveless? <coughs> well, I think this is a big deal and it gives me a creepy feeling, but I'm not sure there's a lot we can do about it. I have nothing for it in this chair. I've said enough. <laughs> Hang two, in there. two or three meetings Hang probably. I'll, see, I'll be back in January. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's nothing else on the legislative update, let's have turkey regulation. Mr. Kent Fricky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Uh, Kent Fricke, uh, small game coordinator based out of the Emporia Research and Survey Office. I do have a presentation for you this morning about um, the turkey stuff. And um, this is the general discussion. And so this is the beginning of a three to four meeting process where we discuss 
uh, Turkey regulations um, for the upcoming year. There we go. And just as a quick reminder, uh, during 2021, last year, we made three uh, changes or discussed three primary topics uh, for turkeys. We increased the spring turkey youth season eligibility to 17 years and younger. And as you'll remember, that was a, uh, a department wide or for all uh, season youth seasons, we tried to do that to make consistency. So we increased that from uh, 15 to 17. We set the 2023 spring and fall season dates, and I'll mention those in, a, in a, another slide or two. And then we um, included handguns as legal equipment, and that was for both the spring and fall seasons. That started with the spring's uh, turkey season and made it a 10-inch choked barrel length and the usual size requirements for other shoulder-mounted uh, shotguns. And so what um, is like what we're planning on doing this year, just to give you an overview of what we're expecting in the next several meetings, we will um, uh, by the end of the year have the 2024 season dates voted on. We will discuss and go over the 2023 spring and fall bag limits. And then again, I'll talk about this more, but um, we'd like to get the commission's feedback on valid units that are contained in the unit four permits. And we'll get more details into that. And so to start off with season dates, there isn't an on off button I need to push, do I? Is it on? Either way, I'll motion to you. Um, so as just a really brief reminder, in terms of the spring season, we have a youth and disabled season that always begins uh, April 1st under our current structure. And they get uh, youth disabled, get a full weekend. And then archery season begins on the Monday after that first full weekend. And they get nine days. And then um, the regular season, which includes shotguns, begins the Wednesday after the second full weekend. So youth disabled get a weekend, a full weekend. Um, archery gets a full weekend. And then the regular season starts on the following Wednesday. And then beginning in 2020, the fall season was changed to from October 1st until J January 31st, was reduced down to a 41 day season from October 1st to November 10th. And so uh, this year, um, April 2022, uh, this is what our season structure looked like. Um, this is one of the earlier uh, starts to the, to the regular season. And you see where youth in blue, archery in yellow and youth, and the regular season starting on the 13th. And uh, again, in 2022, we will have that October 1st to November 10th uh, fall season. Um, again, for 2023, this has already been um, approved last year. This will be the earliest start that we can have before the, the calendar starts repeating itself every seventh year. And so next year, what we're looking at is uh, youth disabled season, the first and second of April, followed by nine days of archery, and then the regular season starting on April 12th. And if we um, continue that structure moving forward, what we're looking at for 2024 is then a flip of that. And so we'll have the latest start to the regular season where um, because April 1st falls on a Monday, we won't have a uh, full weekend for youth until um, uh, the 7th or uh, 6th and 7th. And then we'll have um, the other seasons going through that. So that's what we can expect if we continue this structure. Next slide. Really brief overview of spring turkey abundance. This is updated through April, which we, we did our most recent real mail carrier survey. 
Um, this is the statewide estimate. We saw a little bit of a bump this year, but um, certainly probably within you know confidence intervals. And and main point of this that I'd like to make is that um, as as folks have mentioned, and we know from previous meetings that the turkey population statewide in Kansas um, peaked around the late 2000s, around 2008, and then we've kind of seen this slow decline since then. Next. And so if we start in the western portion of the state, this is the northwest and, and southwest uh, units, units one and four. And uh, again, you see the increases kind of by unit and then these, these slower declines. But especially in the west, we see relatively stable populations um, according to our survey, uh, kind of from 2012 on. Um, again, a slight decrease, but you see a little more um, interaction with, with weather events there. Now in the central portion of the state, this is units two and units five, um, you see a little bit more of a dramatic change and we get more into what we typically think of as, as turkey habitat that would support a higher density of turkeys. And again, after 2012, you see this kind of slow decline. Um, and, uh, and, and this was the, the central portion of the state was most affected by the 2019 uh, flooding events as well. And then in the eastern part of the state, um, again, this, this slow decline uh, peaks happened a little bit earlier. This was more associated with uh, the late 2000s. And again, these are the areas of the state that, that support higher densities of turkeys overall because of just more habitat. Um, but I will say you'll notice in 2012 that most recent, those re most recent dots on the, the right side of that um, graph, um, I think we did get a pretty decent hatch uh, last year, and we, we've got a decent um, increase uh, this year. The question is in the next couple of years of, of whether or not that peak will sustain itself or not. Next. And a quick overview of turkey permit sales that we've been seeing. Next. In the fall, uh, we, we continue to have low participation and, and a declining um, participation rate in, in our fall season. And that is also true in the, the spring season as well, but not as, uh, as quickly dropping off. And so you see on the right, kind of the, the um, 10 to 20% or 10 to 15% in terms of uh, actual permit buyers um, on the, the spring season, uh, still a high, relatively high percentage of, of non-residents. Um, and we'll look at a, a couple graphs here to look at that a little more long-term Next slide. And so this is what the fall season looks like uh, since 2016. Um, 2017 was the first year that there were no game tags uh, available in the fall season. And you again see this slow, um, slow uh, decrease in terms of the numbers of uh, certainly residents, but, but non-residents as well using the, the fall season. Next. And then when we look at the spring season, um, of course, 2020 was, was COVID where we had um, a restricted amount of non-residents that were allowed to hunt during that, that spring season. And so we see the dip there. Um, but in general, um, a declining resident base of, of turkey hunters, and then, uh, which is the dotted middle line. And then you see the, the number of non-residents um, been relatively consistent year to year on that, that bottom dashed line. Next. And uh, nothing really new here, just, just a reminder in terms of bag limits on the right, we still have, uh, for 2022, we had um, uh, two bird bag limits in units one and two, the Northwest and North Central. And then the, what's circled in red there is the one bird bag limits in those three units. And then of course, unit four in the Southwest has a, a one bird limit as well with a limited draw for those, those 500 permits. Next. Oh, and I will mention too, there, um, as of this morning, there were no hunting incidents uh, reported during our uh, turkey season that we know of, so which was, which was good to hear. Um, and then an issue that we haven't brought to the commission before, but we would appreciate feedback on. Um, for, for several years, some of our biologists have been interested in um, uh, whether or not the unit four permits should be allowable to be used in adjacent units. Um, so currently unit four, the Southwest unit there in dark gray is, is a 500 permit draw system that happens every uh, January, February is the application period. 
Half of those by statute are required for landowners that they apply for. And then the, the remainder, whether that's whether they get used or not, uh, the remainder can be applied for by any uh, Kansas resident. Currently, if you draw one of those permits, it's about, certainly valid in unit four, but also in each of those adjacent units, units one, two, and five, which are in the light gray. And so um, we, uh, we're just asking thoughts at this point in terms of your thoughts on restricting that to be only allowed for unit four. Um, some of the comments that we've heard in support of this change would be that um, with more people traveling more for, for turkeys, even among just Kansas residents, that if, um, if they're restricted to unit four, then some might not be as likely to apply for those tags that they you know, might just be able to take advantage of them in, in those adjacent units. Um, and if there's fewer people applying for those tags, that there might be more opportunity for the residents that actually live in unit four that may not be landowners that they may have an additional opportunity to hunt in their own unit um, by applying for by applying for and getting one of those permits. And so um, again, no recommendations on, on any of these and certainly not this yet. We, we will bring those forward to you in August, but I would appreciate any thoughts that the commission might have on that. Next. And just a reminder of, of uh, kind of the process that we get data each year. Turkeys, uh, which I really like as a, as a biologist, is that um, we're currently doing our spring survey of, of spring turkey hunters right now. That ends next week on, on June 30th. I take that, um, that data, analyze it, and in early July, I have a turkey committee meeting, which the turkey committee is made up of public lands managers, uh, wildlife division biologists, and uh, National Wild Turkey Federation law enforcement. Um, we meet and go over those most recent data. And then um, I develop uh, recommendations um, with our staff. And then those will present, be presented at the August 4th uh, workshop session. At that meeting, I'll have additional information in terms of population trends, harvest estimates, and our staff recommendations. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Are there any questions, Kent, from the commission? Do you differentiate between permit buyers and hunters? Yes. Or is there? Yes. So the numbers presented here are permit buyers because those are pretty easy to get from our, our licensing system. Um, those give us you know, all the associated information you get from permit buyers. But then in our survey, we ask, did you hunt on your permit? And there's obviously a, a number that, that don't. And so um, we then, in terms of developing our harvest estimates, take that percentage into account when we extrapolate that information to the remainder of the permit buyer population. So typically be around 95, 90 to 95% of hunters do hunt but that's typically uh, the, the ratio. I'm just curious if that's changing because with the declining numbers, I know that there are a number of people that are going ahead and buying permits, but with no intent of hunting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious yep. when you show that graph yep. in the future, what the difference between those two is. Yep. So. And, and, and so each year, um, and I can try and make sure I have this for, for our August presentation, but um, again, we have a... a we reduce our permit buyers down to active hunters. And then that active hunters is what we use to uh, calculate harvest hunter success and all those associated parameters. Can we go back uh, to Commissioner that? Spore. Uh, uh, how reliable do you how think reliable? that mail carrier surveys are? I, I, uh, I have no reason to doubt them. I mean, th this is a survey that we've had going on since the, since the 80s. Um, and again, there's, there's no reason not to believe that it's any different now than it had been before. Again, I will say though, the caveat to that is that it is an abundance index. It's not, uh, it's not an, a population estimate. It's turkeys per hundred miles traveled. And so that's not a density estimate. That's not an abundance estimate. It's, it's what we have available to us. Ideally we would have, um, you know, for example, a, a population estimate statewide, a population estimate per hunt unit that we could rely on. Um, 
and and do other things with, but it gives us a, a general sense of what the trends are in those areas. And so um, to that extent, I'm, I'm fairly confident in our real mail, mail carrier survey. <laughs> Mr. I Mr. Had, Chair. Uh, oh, this is Commissioner Four. I, I had interviewed several longtime mail carriers and asked them if they were participating in, and both the long time, long time mail carriers that I interviewed basically said they don't even fill the surveys out anymore. They don't have time, they say. So that's just my thought. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and to that extent, um, we receive 300 to 500 of these back each time we do this. Um, and so, and we adjust for those, uh, for those um, participation rates. Um, and, and so I, I still believe we have a good coverage of the state and what it represents of our populations. Yeah. Mr. Chair, yeah. like I, I appreciate Commissioner Spore's question. And uh, this uh, reminded me of a conversation I recently had with Kent about this very question. How much confidence do you have in our data? And Kent and I were at a conference with uh, turkey managers from all across the country. And, and so Kent gave me a response that was relative to what other states had to rely on and why he had confidence in, in uh, this long-term data set we have here. So Kent, would you give them your perspective on that? Just in general, I, I would put our data um, in the various forms of our data up against anybody in the, in the country. We, sur we survey populations four times a year with the real mail carrier survey. We survey our hunter base with both spring and fall uh, postseason hunter harvest surveys. We get additional uh, brood information from our staff, um, uh, brood upland bird surveys that are done uh, each July and August. Um, we have a lot of information that we have available to us, and I'm, I'm extremely confident in the, in, in the numbers that we produce and, and our ability to make decisions based off of those. A number of other states don't have surveys they they may not have turkey permits so they they don't know who all's even hunting turkeys um they don't have brood surveys uh and and have to use alternative means if anything for those and so i'm really confident in the amount of data and, and the the type of data we have to make decisions and, and Kent, last thing comment on the value of the fact that so much of that is long term you have comparability. Talk about that in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the fact that we can, just as the real mail carrier survey as an example, compare 2022 data to 1986 and 1995 in, in some form or fashion, is it, is it the best possible? No, but we rarely have the best, best possible, but it's long-term and, and we have that ability to, um, to, uh, to make those comparisons in at least some form or fashion. And so, um, again, I'll just come back. I'm really confident in, in what we have available to us. Mr. Chairman. Any other yeah. yeah. Uh, Commissioner Gefeller. Uh, on the unit four question, do, do we know now how many unit four permit holders hunt on adjacent units? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, in that we do not ask on a survey you know, do you have a one of these limited draw permits, like a, a unit four permit, mm -hmm. and um, and then we don't, and so we because we don't ask that, we do ask what county you harvested a turkey in, and what what uh, county you spent the most time hunting in is, but we don't have the ability to go back and say did you have just a unit four tag or not, and so um, we have more anecdotal information in terms of just one on one conversations. Um, I've had at, at like the level of one or two calls in the last five years, both ways of, um, of a, a hunter that of, of a landowner that did not have a unit four permit, but, um, and so they couldn't hunt in unit four, but they could hunt their other property in unit five, mm -hmm. um, vice versa. They could only hunt their property in unit four. If this were to go into effect. They could only hunt their property in unit four, but couldn't across, hunt their property in across the uh, across the highway in unit five if we reduce that adjacent unit. So, um, so yeah, I guess short answer or long answer to your short question of no, we don't have information in terms of those unit four hunters. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions for Kent? Yeah, Kent, uh, Commissioner Spore, when we were at Beloit a month or so ago, there, and also in the Northwest unit, uh, lots of people are complaining about lack of turkeys. Are you considering uh, taking the Northwest unit and the North Central unit down to just one tag? That, that's certainly in consideration. And um, as you know, we um, try to develop our staff recommendations based on our adaptive harvest strategy, which we've, we've talked about with the commission before. And those are based on uh, resident hunter success within each of those units. And one of the things that has um, kept those units in terms of staff recommendations at two birds is that they sustained higher resident hunter success five or six years ago and kind of delayed that process. So these, these were also the two units that had uh, the ability to have game tags. Up, so you could uh, bag limit of four birds in the fall season, the longest. And so be, because of that, um, we're still working down the steps in terms of, um, of reducing the, on the spring side. Um, but that's certainly a, a consideration, a concern that I hear both from biologists and, um, and hunters out there. And so, I, I, so yes, it's certainly on the, the consideration for this year. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, Commissioner Capello again. Um, we had quite a bit of conversation this morning about uh, the turkey population. And probably the, the one thing most people can agree on is that it's declining. Um, how steep it is might have some different opinions. But anyway, we had uh, a lot of discussion about different ideas that um, we, we might want to consider in terms of trying to reverse the trend. And since we really can't uh, pinpoint, I guess, exactly what what's causing the decline. So uh, in, in the future meetings, if if um, you could bring us discussion around shorter seasons, smaller bag limits, predator pressure and, and uh, solutions to that, if, if that are, is an issue and any of the other things that were discussed or even ideas you have that weren't discussed this morning. Certainly. Uh, Commissioner yeah. Schwar, uh, Kent, you know, maybe we ought to talk about discontinuing that fall season again. Maybe that needs to be part of it, too. Be a little bit proactive and and go from that standpoint and maybe get rid of that fall season. Thank you. When you're doing your, your computations for your adaptive strategy, if you've got decreasing hunter numbers, but the ones that are still going are being fairly aggressive, their success rates may not change or go up. And yet we're really hunting less and less because people are voluntarily dropping out. So how do you, how do you track that? If you go just on success rate, it's not a true picture because it's not, 200 people being successful, it's 100 people being successful. How do you accommodate for those decreasing numbers? Is that part of that algorithm that you go through? Yeah. And as I mentioned, we only figure in active hunters. And so granted, if those active hunters are more successful, you, you would potentially have kind of some higher success rates. I understand what you're saying there. Um, but at the same time, it, it one of the things we I don't believe we can account for is is hunter experience and ability. I guess um, if uh, if you have fewer hunters and they're more successful, is that because there were more birds, or is it because they were just better hunters? Um, and so it's it just really hard to take that into account. The other thing that I'll mention too is that. Um, as in most of our uh, game seasons in Kansas and, and across the country, we're, we're often trying to balance uh, hunter opportunity and hunter satisfaction with, um, with the biological needs of the, of the species. And I'll say that while um, there's certainly potential for 
uh, harvest, spring harvest of males to have a, a negative impact. Like th that also hasn't been the primary assumption in the last 20 years of, of turkey management. And so that's something that um, as a general research community and, and community of turkey biologists is still a, a big question mark of whether or not that's actually having an, a negative impact or not. Certainly from a, a spring season standpoint, we hear from, from hunters, other biologists, that, that um, in terms of hunter satisfaction, we may want to see lower bag limits, for example. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, a biological impact of reducing that either. And so, again, we're in an area era of, of more uncertainty in terms of the biological impacts of that for turkeys. So, for example, it's if I go to any other state that has had a, a one bird bag limit for a long time, their population trends aren't necessarily different than what we're seeing in Kansas. Or if I go to, uh, as an example, Texas, where you can have as many as a, a five bird permit uh, bag limit, they don't necessarily have any differences either there either. And so again, that that's part of that balancing act between um, making sure that we're as proactive as, as we can be in terms of uh, protecting our, our turkey resource, but also providing opportunity when we feel it's it's available. Any Kent, other questions for Kent? Kent, Commissioner Escarino. Uh, I look see here that you're looking for feedback with regards to restricting the uh, unit four and not being able to utilize the, the remaining parts in, in the other uh, attached units, adjacent to units. Uh, I think that will probably be a good idea to help uh, with the uh, declining population. Uh, and, and I think that recommendation is, is something that I would be good with. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, Kent, you want to move on to prairie chickens? Yep. Um, so the last time I talked with the commission about uh, lesser prairie chickens was back in March at our March meeting. And since then, I was, I was hoping I could have a, um, an update for you in terms of what the Fish and Wildlife Service had, had finally decided on. Um, we do not yet have that decision. And so I don't have that much of an update but I'd certainly be happy to answer questions. Um, but just as a, as a brief reminder, uh, lesser prairie chickens were listed as a threatened species uh, back in 2014. They were removed from the endangered species list um, as threatened in 2016, uh, in June of 2016. In September of 2016, they were repetitioned to be on the list. And then um, the, in uh, June 1st of last year, 2021, the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed uh, lesser prairie chickens uh, under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in areas including Kansas and then as in endangered in portions of New Mexico and, and Texas. And so by law, they're required to develop a, to, to receive public feed, but, uh, public comment on, on that proposed listing, which the department provided a, a letter, a comment letter um, to that effect that last September. And then by law, they were uh, supposed to, by June 1st, come up with a, um, a decision on that proposed rule, whether to um, enact it as proposed, um, as, as threatened in Kansas, whether to say that it was warranted but precluded for, for other things, and, uh, or that it didn't require um, listing. And so we're waiting on um, information from that on, on what the service's final decision is. Um, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma did make a formal request to the, to the Fish and Wildlife Service for a six-month extension. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service is currently considering that, that request. And um, I'm hopeful by the end of the week that we have information back on whether that uh, extension is, is granted or not, or if, um, if there will be a, a decision that comes forth. So um, to that effect, like I say, we, we coordinate uh, weekly with the Fish and Wildlife Service and with our other conservation partners on lesser prairie chicken issues, um, especially concerning the potential uh, listing decision. And along with that, we're, we're undertaking a number of conversations on recent funding opportunities for lesser prairie chicken conservation work in the state and with our neighboring states. So uh, more to come on that decision. But if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. 
Any questions for Kent? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the 2020 Licensed Angler Survey, Susan Steffen. I have a presentation here. Jason's going to get that loaded. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission and, of course, the public joining us. So my name is Susan Steffen, and I like to kind of explain what I do. I don't speak in front of the commission very often, so I have kind of a unique position. As a human dimension specialist, what I am is really this hybrid of uh, people scientists as well as wildlife fishery scientists. So really, I pride myself on conducting applied research in the realm of human dimensions. And what I mean by this is really just trying to figure out what problems our management biologists are having and applying the proper research techniques and methods to get at the information from our anglers such that we are maximizing experiences according to what is possible for the fishery as well as um, helping meet the needs of our anglers as well. I'm gonna go ahead and try this, Jason. Try. See if it works. My kids show me a YouTube video. If you put it up to your head, sometimes it works. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> it's okay. Didn't work. It did not work. I tried it. <laughs> did you wanna flip through or you wanna? Do the other side. Do the other side. Mind your way. Can you see? All right. <laughs> when my mouse is getting low, I just take the battery out and then put it back in. And that gives me another day. <laughs> Good news, Kent. It's not just you. Blame it on the ghost of Miller because this is Miller's. Uh, that's okay, no problem. <laughs> we'll just wait a few seconds here. Unless Sheila wants to flip it through for me. She's like that. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I guess I'll just fill in a little bit of background information about the Licensed Angler Survey. So we have um, this Licensed Angler Survey that we do periodically between five to every seven years. And I do have a slide later on a little bit with more information, but the, this one was done in 2020, well, it was done on the 2020 batch of, of people. Thank you. And um, we've, uh, I joined the agency in 2009 and then I've also done a survey in 2013. So this is something that is done periodically to really just help us ascertain some trend data and get at basic information about who our anglers are, what they're fishing for, where they're going, how often, as well as an opportunity to ask some special questions. Hey, it works. <laughs> right, so we have surveys that we've done all the way back through 1975. And the one there in that brownish color is one that I've done since I've been with the agency. And hopefully I will have a few more under my belt in my career. The 2020 survey had some repeat questions pretty much for trend information. So I was saying earlier, um, information on angler demographics, fishing participation and characteristics, and some of those special topics that I will go over today include the importance of some of our fisheries programs and services, and also maybe some factors that prevent or help people uh, participate in fishing, as well as why or their fishing motivations. And then like any good researcher, in light of an unexpected year of, of COVID, I wanted to take advantage of that and learn a little bit more about how COVID impacted uh, fishing participation in Kansas. I will not be presenting the whole gamut of information and results from the survey, but there will be a report later on that will be available to, of course, the commissioners and members of the public and agency as well. 
I'm going to spend a little bit of time here on methods because I heard some of the conversation we had surrounding uh, the turkey information, and I just want to really impress upon you that uh, survey data is is priceless. It's worth its weight in gold. But we have very rigorous procedures and methods that we go through as social scientists to make sure we are getting an accurate representation of the population. So some of that includes, uh, like I have listed on the slide here, what's called a mixed mode survey. And so for this particular survey, I selected 10,000 people from random from our license file, and that included both residents and non-residents. And the survey was administered starting in June of 2020. And that first invitation to take the survey was received as a postcard with a link to take the survey. And so that multi-mode or mixed mode method that I'm talking about, we then followed up with the same people that uh, the ones that had responded, we did not repeat, you know, send information to them, but we did keep track of people if they did or did not respond. So that's how I knew who to send follow-up questionnaires to. So then in September and November, if need be, we sent up to two copies of that mail questionnaire. And really those multiple waves of surveys are meant to really get at uh, even those people who are reluctant to maybe complete the survey. The idea there is that they, uh, they, they give in, so. Okay, I have several slides now with results, so I'll just kind of go through and explain these. Um, we had just under 2,000 surveys returned out of that original 10,000. Now you look at this response rate, okay, 22%. That may not seem like very much, and it's not but that is the norm. I have a community of practice with other HD specialists across the country, and we are seeing the low response rates across the board, no matter what state, no matter what animal or creature you're studying. The fact is people are just surveyed and surveyed to death. And so, um, you know, you go to the store and you get a receipt and it has a survey. Mm. You, I don't know about you, every time I go to the doctor, then I get an email, fill out this survey. No more Stormont Vale, thank you. Um, one of the ways that we can kind of adjust for that non-response error. So what non-response error is, we suspect sometimes that people that don't respond to this survey may be different from people who do respond. So we have to account for that by doing some, um, some checks with the data. So with the variables that I have at my disposal based on information I know about everyone, in my sampling frame, I look at those variables and compare those two. And I found that people that were more likely to respond were older, so they had a higher average age. And it was like 54 versus 44 for an average age respondent versus non-respondent. Um, and then even just the presence of an email address in our database. People that had an email address were more likely to respond. And then I also looked at residency. So residents were more likely to respond than border non-residents, so our surrounding non-residents. And then they were more likely to respond to all the other non-residents. So one of the things that we can do if we know that there are certain factors that make somebody more or less likely to respond, I can apply some weighting to the data, like, you know, weights, weight the data and help account for that non-response. And that will make it a representative sample of the population. Most of our anglers are males, and this is pretty consistent back to the 2013, and I, I believe the 2006 survey as well. 24% um, female, this is holding pretty steady within a percentage or two. And then I talked about my community of practice folks, We've uh, figured out a way to ask about gender in a more inclusive way. So this is the first time I've asked that question, but we do have a small percentage or about 1% who don't feel comfortable telling us what gender they are or are non-binary slash other. So we'll keep asking that. Fishing participation and characteristics. 
The survey question here was, which of the following fishing methods did you use in Kansas in the previous 12 months? And most of the questions as a form of reference refer to in Kansas in the previous 12 months to kind of standardize um, that time frame, no matter when that person got that survey. These percentages are pretty consistent with the 2013 survey, with one exception. The 2013 survey, there were only 13% of people who um, went fishing with non-motorized boat, canoe, or kayak. And in the 2020 survey, we found it to be 19%. The others, limb lines, full line, hand fishing, and ice fishing decreased, but motorized boat and bank fishing stayed about the same percentages. I don't know about you, but that matches what I see, at least when I go on the lake, is certainly more kayakers and non-motorized boats. How many number of days are people participating and where? We find private ponds uh, has the highest average day usage. Um, oh, I want, I sorry, I forgot to mention, people can fish with more than one method, right? So this is why the percentages aren't 100% totaled. So people uh, select more than one. That's why it's over 100%. Okay, going back to our days of participation, private ponds by far was um, the highest percentage, or I'm, I'm sorry, the highest average, and reservoirs were next at 6.1 days in the previous 12 months, all the way down to uh, walk-in fishing access or WEFA, which was a little bit less popular. And overall, uh, the average days of participation was 28 days, which is pretty high. Um, but we got a big standard deviation there. So that helps explain some of it. Oh my goodness. When I conduct the survey, the very first thing that a lot of the fisheries folks ask me is what are the preferred species? And I, I came up with the, the ranking here and I have it from top to bottom from most preferred to least and largemouth bass continues to reign as number one. Crappie is number two, three is channel catfish, walleye is the fourth most preferred, and blue catfish are the fifth most preferred. The way that I analyze this question is that um, I apply weights to the various rankings. So if somebody mentions, hey, crappie are my fourth most preferred species, that is not weighed as heavily as if somebody puts crappie as their number one. So that will help uh, adjust for some of those preferences in there if you're wondering where that weighted rank score comes out. One of the questions on the survey also asks, well, hey, where do you go fishing? Like name, tell me the exact spot, tell me the GPS court, no, I'm kidding. Just okay. tell me where in general, <laughs> thank you. I, <laughs> I want on your list. <laughs> I fish my private pond, Walnut Creek. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a list of probably 30, 40 locations that people specifically mention. So the percent here that you see, the highest one was 19.5% for private ponds. That may not seem like a lot, but it was the plurality considering we had a list of you know 35 different locations. So the next on the list, the second, third through 10th, you know, most popular locations are all reservoirs. So Milford was uh, pretty high on the list there, followed by Hillsdale, Cheney, El Dorado, Clinton, Perry, Melbourne, Glen Elder, and Pomona rounding off the top 10. All right, so this is kind of a busy looking graph here, but what I want you to kind of take away from this this question is pertaining to maybe some factors that will help people get out and participate more or factors that may be more of a constraint or limiting factor. So there are some things on here that maybe we can't control. Um, for instance, the most limiting item on here that people said, hey, this, this is not good for my participation was work commitments. So some of those things are just out of our control. But in general, this is a good question to ask to really understand some of the barriers and obstacles that sometimes people face when they go fishing. Likewise, what enables them to get out there and participate the most. There's a dotted line, a dotted vertical line there in the middle, that's the neutral line. 
if a value is above that dotted line, it is an enabler. And if it's below that, it's one of, it's considered a limitation. So we have kind of this nice like point of inflection there in the middle, but the top five most enabling factors are somebody's interest in fishing, fishing near their home, their health, fishing skills, and their interest in indoor activities. Conversely, so reading from the bottom going up, the five most limiting factors, work commitments, number of people fishing nearby, other people fishing near me, weather conditions, and entrance fees. It's also important for us to understand why people go fishing. Asking people for their motivations is a really good way to get at this information. Again, you'll see a dotted vertical line that represents almost like that neutral value or level of importance that's kind of in the middle. If you see a value above that, it's an extremely important motivator. If you see below that dotted line, that is a less important motivator. Many of the motivations that are on the upper end here are um, more related to um, getting out in nature. So like the first one is just for the fun of catching fish. Number two, to be outdoors. Uh, relaxation, to be close to nature, get away from my daily routine. And that's pretty consistent across the years. Some of those just more benefits of being out in nature motivators we typically see pretty high. Some of the motivations that are a little bit lower on the list, um, way down on the importance level is competing for prizes or money. That's just one of those things people don't seem to be motivated by. Um, and you have to consider that the population we're looking at, right, is licensed anglers. So this is people who are already out there fishing. The second uh, most, how do I say it? Second limiting factor or motivation is to catch a trophy sized fish. That one kind of caught me by surprise. Obtain fish for eating and physical exercise. So uh, some of those more catch specific motivations are not nearly as um, enabling, I suppose. I just have a personal research interest in looking at gender differences in various things. So looking at gender differences in fishing motivations was pretty exciting for me. <laughs> um, these confidence intervals that you see on here, a really quick visual way to see if there are statistical differences is when those confidence intervals do not overlap. So there are three on this list of fishing motivation motivators where the intervals do not overlap. So that means for males or females for the respective item, one was more of a motivating factor. And I'm gonna test my eyesight here. So I believe it was to be close to nature. The pink bar is separate from the blue bar, which is um, females are more likely to be motivated or at least see it as a more important motivator than males to be close to nature. The other motivator that was different was family recreation. That was more important for females. And the last one for the challenge or sports, that was more of an important motivator for our male anglers. I just find that pretty interesting to go through and analyze. Um, I guess I should also mention, so part of my job is really to help interpret this information and tell our fisheries managers and administrators how they can apply this information. So in the instance of maybe setting a marketing campaign or something, we can have some materials that are a little bit more geared towards these different personas or um, you know, realizing that family is more important to females. Those are just some of the ways that we can use this information. The fisheries division has, gosh, I think I had a list of 32 programs and services that at the time of the survey that we offered for the public. So out of this list of 32, I'm gonna present the slides with the top eight, as well as the least rated, so the bottom eight um, programs and services. So this time that neutral line is going to be a dotted line going across that horizontal line of moderately important. So if you see a value above that dotted line, that means it is extremely important. And if you see, um, 
the mean value below that dotted line, then that is on the not so important side of things. The ones that I've <laughs> highlighted here, the programs I've highlighted in the yellow circle are ones that were significantly different. So let me back up and mention that the survey I'm talking about is uh, licensed anglers, right? So the general licensing anglers. I also asked our fisheries division staff what they thought of the importance of our fisheries programs and services. And that was really interesting as well, because if we have this mismatch, right, we could be potentially putting resources into a program that uh, maybe is one of our favorite programs, but is not useful for the public or important to them. So it was pretty interesting to see this. This was a statistical difference. So, um, Anglers are represented by the blue bars and the fisheries division staff are represented by the, the reddish brownish bars. Um, our staff, our KDWP fisheries division thought that enforcement of regulations was more important than the public. Conversely, Operation Game Thief, the public thought that was more important than our division. And then as someone in the research division, I have to admit, yes, I think fisheries research is very important. <laughs> but we thought research was more important than the general inkling public. Okay, so now the bottom nine. What you'll notice is there are no statistically different um, programs here. So, I mean, some of them came pretty close, but I use a p-value of 0 0.10, so it's a little bit more um, forgiving, I suppose. But the most of these were rated below that moderately important level. So these are the bottom programs that for the most part were in agreement with the public, our people and the public that these are some of our least important programs. Some of these surprised me, but I think what you'll see is several of the items mentioned on here are more of like a um, uh, like an outreach material. So our newsletters, the mobile app, the magazine, um, GPS coordinates of fish attractors, Facebook posts. The mobile aquarium really surprised me because I tend to think that's a very good um, public outreach uh, that, that our division does, but apparently it's not very important uh, to, to the people in the survey, <laughs> as well as the Master Angler Award. So those are ranked from uh, left to right from highest to lowest mean. Okay, now the fun part, the COVID section. So I did ask people, hey, during COVID, you know, hey, did you, did you go fishing? And for the most part, the majority, 80, I can't read that, is that 88%, 87%? Yeah, 87% did go fishing during the pandemic. I asked that question on the survey, no matter what, regardless of COVID, and it's usually around 88 to 90%. So I think, Kent, when you mentioned that um, 90 to 95% of turkey hunters that buy a permit actually go turkey hunting, for us, it's a little bit lower in fisheries. It's anywhere, I, I guess I should say, I think it's like 85 to 88%. So there are some people who for our all intents and purposes, plan to go, but they just don't get around to it. Were there differences in male and female participation levels? Nope, they, uh, they both got out there or didn't get out there fishing in similar uh, fre frequencies, percentages. This one actually, um, it didn't surprise me so much as kind of was a relief because we heard that there were so many people out recreating COVID, during COVID, recreating outside was one of the safest forms of recreation and being around or trying to avoid people that you could get. And so maybe people were crowded, but according to the results from this survey, really people were not nearly as crowded when they were out fishing as they originally expected to be. So that's good news. Who people went fishing with changed during the COVID pandemic. And I say during, we're, we're still kind of in it, you know, we still have COVID, so it's not like it's, it's over. So the question, <coughs> excuse me, 
is asking people to relate the differences before COVID versus um, on the survey, I think I mentioned, okay, so consider the pandemic like March, 2020 onward. But we found that people fished more with family or alone. So you can see the percentages there. Well, I can't even read them now. <laughs> it's a little, little bit tiny, but family I believe went from like 40 to 46%. And uh, similarly for a loan, it, it did bump up there. <coughs> Excuse me. People also were less likely to travel further to get to their fishing locations. They were traveling an average of about 36 miles versus about 40 miles. And that may not seem like a big difference, but it was significant. People were fishing closer to home during the pandemic. I bet if we ask this today, it'll be a lot less than that due to those gas prices. But you have to remember this was back in 2020. <coughs> I gave a whole nother presentation about um, other impacts due to COVID at a different conference. One of the great things about surveys is that I can ask some open-ended questions and just allow freehand uh, writing or, or messaging or texting on the, the computer. And I like to present these word clouds to really see what kind of words pop up. These quotes that are on the bullets are directly from the survey. So the, these are the words of some of our anglers. Um, they did say it seemed like there was a lot more trash and we did have an increase in participation. So with that came more trash. People were having a hard time finding um, bait <laughs> and fishing gear. There was stores that were just sold out. So um, definitely seeing that bump and then some colorful comments as well. <laughs> I can't read it. I'd love to read that, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for letting me present um, full report coming soon. I'm just about done. I'm making it more of a user-friendly report and trying to not get overly um, stats heavy. So look for that report coming soon. Mr. Chairman, I that's all I had, unless there's questions or- Are there any questions? Turn it over to you. Mr. Chair, uh, I might open with one, with your permission. Uh, Brad Lull, the secretary. So I, I was really glad to see that you, you ask both the anglers in the, in the public, as well as staff, and talk about how that might, uh, recognizing those differences in responses and perceptions might inform our decision-making, would you? Well, that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, I do think it, it kind of gives us internally just thinking about myself even as a person, a part of the division, um, to really kind of see what the public considers are our rising stars or our shining stars. And sometimes that doesn't always line up with what we think. One of the things that I, I wrote a real, just you know quick two page report and sent it out to the division, but some of the things that were not rated as highly by the public versus us that are very important to us, things like creel surveys, research, population sampling. As fisheries experts, we know that is very important and we need to do those to do our job effectively. So that in terms of, you know, allocating resources, that is, you know, my opinion should not be taken off the table. But if you have, you know, to take a second look at your resources and you're starting to look at things that are rated a little bit lower, that to me is where you start considering yeah, like programs, um, right? programs that might need to get shifted mm -hmm. to something else. And that can be hard to swallow especially if it's really important to you. Like I like the mobile aquarium, but yeah. Sure. We'll Any see. other questions? Commissioner Escarino. Susan, um, do you know where you got the results from the survey? What counties you got the surveys from or I do. You know, what part of the state they came from? And it, it, is it somewhat equal throughout? Like yeah. Southwest, Northwest, Central, North Central? Yeah, I actually had a, a professor at Emporia State University uh, plot the responses 
in ArcGIS, mm -hmm. and that will be a part of the report as well. Okay. But we had um, reports or surveys returned from, I think, every single county. Okay. And uh, we had a very good distribution across the state. Awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you. And where is the aquarium? Where does the aquarium go to? Where, where, what parts of the state? Does it go to the county fairs? Is it, where does it go to? So that depends on the year. There's, you know, we've been under COVID, so it's been a little different sure. with COVID. But from my understanding, um, there are entities that can kind of put in an application for that. And the person in charge of that, I believe, is David Breath who's our sport fish educator, and he receives those applications and can kind of decide where that resource can go. Um, it's very big and it takes a lot of manpower. You have to get the fire department to fill it up. The hatcheries have to help us stock it with fish. Mm -hmm. People have to go electrofish and get some uh, some fish as well. So it's, it's a big endeavor. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time. Now we'll talk about bald eagle telemetry. Zach, Eddie? He's on. He's online. Okay. All right, folks, am I successfully off mute? Yes. Good deal. Um, as I get my screen shared here, I will introduce myself. I'm Zach, Eddie terrestrial ecologist with the uh, ecological services section of the department based out of Pratt. One of my primary duties with the department is uh, as serving as the department's lead for environmental review of, of energy projects. But today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a bald eagle telemetry research study that we kicked off last year and how that kind of overlaps with, with my day-to-day -day, uh, work reviewing, reviewing and providing comments for wind farms and energy infrastructure. Um, by way of, of uh, providing a little bit of background to eagle populations in Kansas, I would just say that, that the first recent document, uh, you know, recent history documentation of a successful bald eagle nest in the state occurred in 1989. Uh, population slowly but steadily expanded through the state in the 90s and early 2000s. By then, a kind of ad hoc group of, of citizen scientists and, and local conservationists had, had come together to document and monitor nesting attempts across the state. And then by 2007, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delisted the bald eagle from the federal endangered species list. We followed suit delisting it from our state list in 2009, uh, and populations have, have been very successful and, and, and expanded into large, a large swath of the state uh, since then. In 2019, we learned that, that a few other states around us were working with uh, the U.S. Geological Survey and uh, a, cons an, a consulting firm called Conservation Science Global to, to look at, at eagle home range sizes and, and space use uh, in those states. One of those birds uh, from Oklahoma sadly perished in Kansas. Uh, and we got really interested in the, the quality of the telemetry data that they were able to, uh, to collect on that individual prior to, to it dying uh, in central Kansas. And, and that led to some discussions with uh, uh, both those two entities, USGS and Conservation Science Global, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Evergy. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Ed Evergy uh, formerly West Star Energy had had a good partnership to uh, to access and and band bald eagle fledglings uh, up in northeast Kansas for for the last number of years, and we were able to to leverage that partnership to uh, to to uh, assist us in in accessing these birds and getting them safely on the ground. Uh, to, to carry out our research. So we'd hoped to start our project in 2020. That ended up being delayed because of 
of COVID. We got out to the field in early 2021 and started putting uh, telemetry backpacks on birds in May of, of 2021. The goals of our project are, are kind of threefold. First of all, we want to assess home, home range size and habitat use of, of eaglets that have just fledged prior to their postnatal post nesting dispersal period. So they'll use territory around, around those, those nests they were born in to kind of, kind of get their bearings, learn to fly, learn to hunt, and then eventually they, they head off. Um, during that post uh, dispersal period, that post nest natal dispersal period, we wanted to see where they go, uh, kind of quantify and analyze their behavior uh, uh, through those few years uh, between fledgling and establishing nesting territories themselves, uh, learn more about their use of the landscape and airspace during that time. And uh, through the collection of those data, we believe that we can quantify a relative exposure risk uh, of those birds to energy infrastructure and, and potentially model individual collision risks primarily with, with wind turbines, uh, which will help us uh, uh, provide some recommendations and comments on future wind farms in the state. And, and I've got to say, as, as the population has expanded in the state, that is probably the most common call that I answer is, is a concerned citizen calling to say there's been a wind farm proposed in my area. We're aware of an eagle nest near there. Uh, will that be a risk to them? And, and my, my short answer has always been potentially, um, but we may be able to, to use these data to assess that, that risk. Once we were able to get started with the project, one of the most important uh, uh, kind of starting points was to select nests. And, and what we did was rely on that, that citizen science led effort uh, uh, to determine which nests had successfully incubated eggs and produced eaglets, uh, uh, where they were located in the state and, and kind of get approximate ages on those eaglets. Um, once we had good potential nests uh, over about a two week period, uh, a group of, of our staff would go out with drones and fly above those nests to try to get some good photos to determine how many eaglets were in the nests, uh, what their approximate age was, and uh, whether the, the tree would even be accessible um, uh, to get those birds down safely. We, we were trying to target nests with two to three uh, eaglets in them, and it was very important that those eaglets be between seven and nine weeks old at the time of transmitter fitting. And, and the, the, the short reasoning behind that is they needed to not be capable of flight because we didn't want them to jump out of the nest uh, and fly away, but they needed to be fairly fully feathered and not have much down so that those backpacks could be, could be cinched down on them tight enough that they, they wouldn't cause any risk to the birds or risk of falling off. But, but we knew there wasn't a lot of expansion that was going to happen as down was replaced by by feathers. So we visited a number of nests. You can see in the top right photo, or hopefully you can see uh, some, some gray stripes and spots on the backs of those eaglets. Those were determined to be too young. Um, in the lower right, we found a nest with just one individual. Given the number of people that mobilized to the site and in getting our partners there and so forth, um, you know, nests with one bird weren't ideal. Um, the nest in the lower left was uh, occurred uh, on our Milford wildlife area. Um, it was a tree that was not safe to climb, but it was next to a, a cropland unit um, where we could get a bucket truck up there and, and safely safely get those birds. Um, so that was one of our one of the nests we used. Um, in the end, we, we found six that we could safely get to with a total of 15 birds in them. Um, and, and they were located across uh, kind of central and, and east central Kansas, um, somewhere near reservoirs, somewhere near big rivers, somewhere were near small streams. Um, so, so the little Walnut Creek there in Butler County 
um, was probably the smallest water uh, that, that had a successful nest beside it that we observed. Um, this map is just kind of show that, that no matter a bird's in, it, it had carries some risk of, of contact with energy infrastructure, primarily transmission lines, uh, but certainly wind farms through the state too. If they, if they utilize much landscape and habitat around Kansas, they're probably going to encounter both those things. And, and we also try to get some birds inside the, the governor's wind farm moratorium area as well as outside um, and and we were able to do that. <clears throat> like I've kind of mentioned, um, we accessed the, the nests in two ways. The easiest and best way was to get a bucket truck alongside there. Um, we could get those birds down really quickly, really safely with, with low stress to the birds. But um, an Evergy employee named Ben, who's volunteered his time with, with US Fish and Wildlife Service for a number of years, uh, is a, a very skilled climber. And he volunteered his time to help us with this project. And, and uh, uh, there were a number of nests that, that we couldn't get a bucket truck to for whatever reason. And, and he would hoist himself all the way up the tree, just like he was climbing a rock and uh, get, get a pulley system rigged up in there to lower birds down to us. Um, one of the interesting things was while he was in those nests, uh, oftentimes he would get some visual of, of what the primary food source for those, those birds was. Um, and you can see the, the bottom center photo is a bunch of soft-shelled turtle nests, uh, uh, shells. And that was from a nest along the Ark River in Derby, Kansas, and they were they were targeting those turtles along the banks of the Ark River. Once the eaglets were down, uh, the the research and telemeter fitting uh, started. Those birds were all banded uh, with a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service identification color band on one leg. On the other leg, uh, USGS band that, that identified them as being part of this study. Um, uh, bill depth and beak depth and, and the length of the seventh primary feather on the wing were, were taken to estimate sex and age. Uh, blood samples were taken to uh, do genetics, confirm sex of the birds, and then also test for uh, exposure to contaminants and primarily lead. Uh, is the concern. Lots of eagles, le eagles are very, uh, very sensitive to lead contamination. And uh, it, it's one of the primary killers of the species. And, and so we tested all the birds uh, uh, to see what the levels of lead in their system were. At the end of all that, um, they would be fitted with the telemetry backpacks. And those were, uh, these are backpacks that will stay on for the life of the bird. They've got a rechargeable battery in them that is, is charged by a solar panel on the top of, of the telemeter. It's a, it's a fairly small unit. And that is uh, that backpack is, is secured on so that it should not come off for the life of the bird. Battery life expectancy is about five to six years, um, which should take these birds, assuming survival, uh, until they start to establish nesting territories themselves. Um, I'd also note that, that uh, uh, even though these are big birds, uh, you know, certainly old enough to do a little bit of damage if they get a, a talon into you, once they're uh, on the ground and fitted with these hoods, they're, they're incredibly docile. We didn't have, you know, there was the, no fear uh, shown by the birds at those points. Uh, and, and we certainly didn't have any, any uh, risk to the researchers um, doing the work. Uh, once they were fitted with the telemeters, they were put back on those nests um, and, and the telemetry units were turned on and, and ready to go. The data we're collecting uh, collects a, da a GPS data point every three seconds when the bird is moving and, and when it's stationary, it, it sends a, a point every 15 minutes. Those data points will track the bird's location, speed, heading, altitude, uh, and as well as give us an estimate of GPS precision. So, so we know whether that, you know, a, an outlier point was, was a cause of, of just having bad GPS signal or not. 
These data are all stored internally until the unit comes in range of a cell phone tower. Once they get cell phone service, uh, the, the data is automatically uploaded to the cons uh, a server maintained by Conservation Science Global. Um, and as you can guess, a multi-year uh, data set uh, that may be taking a point every three seconds uh, results in, in a huge amount of data for each bird. I, I looked at uh, five months uh, worth of data from a single bird just the other day to, to, to um, produce some maps and get an estimate. And that five months uh, had uh, just about 240,000 data records. I'm sure there's some birds that have probably moved more that, that have more data records and some that, that have less. But, but through the three years of study, um, uh, we will have a lot of data on each one of these birds. So um, uh, I'm not gonna uh, belabor the point we had 15 nests that, that, that uh, resulted in us putting telemeters on, on 13 different birds. Uh, one of the birds shown down in the bottom was, was deemed too small. And that's what we saw fairly commonly with birds that had, or nests that had three birds in them. You'd have two birds that, that developed faster, were probably capitalizing on more food brought by the parents. And, and one bird, which was essentially the runt, um, who didn't develop as fast. So. We did bring that bird down to the ground uh, to, to do the aging and sexing and blood testing, put a U.S. or a Fish and Wildlife Service color band, uh, identification band on it, and returned it to the nest with, without a backpack. Another bird uh, simply hopped out of the nest onto a limb, and we didn't want to spook that bird uh, any further uh, or put our climber at risk, so, so we just let that bird go. We had two other birds uh, of its siblings in the same nest we could put telemeters on. And, and so here's a couple of, of uh, maps of those birds following that post nesting initial dispersal period uh, over about the course of five or six months. So the top right map, that was a bird uh, from a nest in Derby, Kansas, made it up to the border of the, the northern border of South Dakota and spent its summer there, then overwintered down in the Tulsa area. Uh, the pink track on the bottom left is a bird that came off of Tuttle Creek Wildlife Area, a nest uh, near the Shannon Creek area of that wildlife area. It spent quite a bit of time um, in Kansas over, over that first summer, eventually made it up to central Nebraska, spent a long time along the Platte River, headed back south, spent quite a bit of time in Kansas again. And, and ended up in Bartlesville for a little while before returning to Eastern Kansas uh, to overwinter. Um, just to give you an idea of where those birds are now, um, four of them are up in Manito central Manitoba in Canada. We've got three in North Dakota, one in South Dakota, one in Nebraska, and one on the Kansas-Nebraska line. And one that we has lost its, uh, its GPS has gone haywire and we're gonna have to have uh, the researchers pit, uh, ping it. It was in Manitoba about two weeks ago, but now it's not getting a GPS reading. So I assume it's probably still up there. Uh, we have no indication that that bird has, has died. Um, sometimes you just have to re, reset their, the, the software in those transmitters to, to get them to start reading again. And then we, we sadly had two birds that, that did perish fairly soon after, after leaving their natal territories. That's the point that you see over in, in uh, uh, that's actually New Jersey. Uh, we found those transmitters, sent them back to Conservation Science Global to be refurbished and, and we'll use them again. So, in the future, we've been really impressed by the quality of this day, uh, the, the data we're collecting. Uh, we decided last year, or, or I guess earlier this year, to extend that, that contract for an additional three years and to add some more uh, uh, telemetry backpacks. Um, uh, the addition of years, um, since those backpacks will, will maintain functionality through about six years. Uh, we wanted to see, you know, assuming survival, where do these birds come back to to uh, establish their own nesting territories? The assumption is that they'll return pretty close to where they were born. 
but that obviously is not always the case or we wouldn't have had that first initial nest in, in 1989. So, so how many of them do come back? How close do they stay to that, that territory where they were born? And what proportion of them uh, determine that somewhere else is better? In uh, the spring of 2023, next year, we're, we hope to deploy an, an additional 10 to 15 uh, telemetry units. We're hoping to, to target kind of central and western Kansas uh, to, to see if those birds, uh, those birds, you know, differ in their behavior um, uh, through the years. And so we'll have six years total data, uh, well, five years of total data collected for our initial 13 birds, um, uh, plus an additional three years of da data for the 10 to 15 that we deploy next year. And now that we do have right at a year of, of data, those birds all dispersed uh, uh, in early July 2021. So we're coming up on a full year of data. Uh, the research partners um, uh, can, can begin analysis of that data um, and start, start drawing some conclusions about at least how they're using habitat and, and airspace uh, through that first year of life. So that's a quick rundown. I, I do want to really acknowledge that the folks that assisted us uh, in the, the initial phase of this project. And, and of course, we have to thank the private landowners who allowed us access to their properties to, to, to get to these birds, as well as the individual eagle nest observers who volunteered their time uh, to, to help us locate the nests. Um, uh, make landowner contacts and 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 uh, allow the research to go forward. You see Rex Herndon; he's one of the the observers uh, on the right, and the landowner he put us in contact is is on the left. Um, the those were two birds off that landowner's property uh, as they went back into the bags to be hoisted back into their trees. Um, um, then, of course, Evergy and the use of of a big bucket truck that, that, that sped the project up and, and the, the folks who made their time to go and come out to the field to, to get this kicked off. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them and, and I appreciate your time. Any questions for Zach? Was the first, Zach was the first eagle at Clinton Lake Nest. Uh, you know, I, I, I uh, should have looked that up before I started and I didn't. I, I believe it was up around there, but I, I can't remember if it was Clinton or Perry. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. Mr. Chair, I think it was Perry. I think. Does anybody else want to confirm? I think there I think was, was one Perry. at Clinton early on that they roped off a big area and it was a pretty big deal. Uh, it, it was early, but I think Perry might have been the very first sighting. So you're saying Tom Clinton was the first? It was the first one they roped off. Okay. Okay. It was the first successful one that I remember. I Okay, yeah, I'll have to check, but I, I trust your memory better than mine. Are there any, I, this is a tiny bit off subject, but Zach, are there any um, reports or conclusions drawn from this year? Um, I know there was a substantial number of nest failures this year. Do you have any information or conclusions from that at all yet? Um, uh, no, and, and I'll be honest, my, we had a, a baby in, in March, so as we were on, in the kickoff to, uh, to uh, kind of start observing nests and getting out, uh, we have four telemetry backpack units left, and we were hoping to deploy those this year, uh, but I went on paternity leave instead, um, uh, and through discussions, we decided let's add a few more units instead of bringing, bringing the primary researcher all the way from, from New Jersey uh, uh, to, to put out four, uh, figured we would extend it. So though I have looked at um, the, the observation data this year, I haven't really uh, tried to analyze it for, for differences in success between years. Um, um, but we do see that uh, periodically. Some some uh, some years are just better than others. Thanks and congratulations. 
Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a Wildlife Conservation Award. Good, after good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. My name is Brad Rishoff and I'm the Region 2 Wildlife Supervisor based in Topeka, Kansas. I'm here on behalf of Wes Sowards, our Wildlife Division Director, Assistant Director. Wes was unable to attend today's meeting. Uh, approximately 98% of Kansas is under private ownership. To achieve the department's mission of conserving and enhancing Kansas's natural heritage, its wildlife and their habitats, we must focus on managing and, hand, and enhancing private lands in partnership with landowners of this state, while keeping in mind the goals of the landowner. KDWP currently employs 29 wildlife biologists across the state to work directly with private landowners. The United States Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and other conservation partners to help restore and enhance wildlife habitat on private working landscapes. KDWP's Habitat First program, funded by license sales and federal wildlife restoration dollars, provides both technical and financial assistance to landowners. The department also partners with Pheasants Forever to employ habitat specialists to directly implement beneficial habitat practices on private properties. We're invested in the private lands of this state and want to take this time to celebrate the landowners who are the stewards of our land and its wildlife. With that being said, I would like to read this year's winning nomination for the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Park 2022 State Wildlife Habitat Conservation Award. This nomination was written by Darren Porter, our district wildlife bi biologist based out of the Topeka Region 2 office. <clears throat> I would like to nominate JNN Ranch LLC for the two 2022 State Wildlife Habitat Award for work accomplished on the Gun Barrel Ranch. The ranch is located in Southern Wabunsee County in the heart of the Flint Hills. The ranch is owned and operated by Joe and Norma Hoagland and their family based out of Leavenworth, Kansas. Property is comprised of 3,800 acres of Flint Hills native grass and managed as a stalker and cow-calf operation. As with many property owners and managers, Joe Hoagland was concerned about the changes he was seeing in the composition of the vegetation as Ceresia lespedisa and invasive trees were expanding in Flint Hills. Annual spring burning and widespread chemical applications were not effective in controlling these invasive plants alone. In conjunction with doc, direction from Dr. Casey Olson and others, Joe began to change his management cha strategies from spring burns and widespread chemical application to a fall patch burning strategy and targeted chemical application. In the summer of 2021, an agreement was entered into between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Tallgrass Legacy Alliance, and Jane Ann Ranch LLC. Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program provides cost share for long-term habitat restoration and monitoring. Kansas Wildlife and Parks also agreed to provide funding and labor through its Habitat First program. During the winter of 21, trees were cut and piled on roughly 300 acres of drainages, as well as those scattered across the pastures. The management plan implements grazing and burning strategies to improve the grazing operation while at the same time improving the pastures for grassland and nesting birds, such as the greater prairie chicken, northern bobwhite quail, and many other non-game species. The Hoagland family has agreed to utilize program prescribed burning and spot spraying techniques to, minimum, to minimize damage to the native forb community, which will also provide benefits to many pollinator species as well. Ranch has also been enrolled in the department's walk-in hunting area program, which provide, which is providing excellent hunting opportunity to the public in general. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is continuing to long-term monitoring the habitat improvements. This joint project between private and public entities will continue to improve wildlife habitat on the ranch for many years to come. Uh, Joe and Nova Hoagland were not able to attend today's meeting due to other prior commitments. Uh, accepting the, the award today on behalf is on their behalf is their son and his 
family here is here today also, but Dirk Hoagland is her son is here to accept the award today. Congratulations and thank you for all you have done and continue to do for your wildlife in Kansas. With that, I'll turn it over to Dirk, to Dirk quickly. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Brad and Darren. Uh, they were have been uh, a huge help to us, uh, kind of helping us navigate through this process. Um, but U.S. Fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife, um, the Kansas Department of Wildlife, um, and the Tallgrass Legacy Alliance uh, have have uh, been amazing partners for us. It's been eye opening. We've really enjoyed the partnership. Uh, we've learned a lot and we're already seeing results uh, in, in just this short amount of time already. So we're uh, very excited and look forward to continuing the partnership. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're excited to see the pasture return to the way it is supposed to be. So um, I won't take up much more of your time, but we really are honored and, uh, and thank you. And uh, we appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Uh, Clinton State Park update. I think we're gonna have a little photograph here maybe. Short break. Uh, yeah, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, now that you're up here, that's fine. Yeah, let's <laughs> we'll take a 10 minute break. <clears throat>
Let's, let's take our seats. We'll now talk about Clinton State Park update. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commission. Uh, I'm Connor O'Flanagan. I'm the park manager here at Clinton State Park right outside of Lawrence. So I was just going to give you guys an update kind of on what we've been doing, uh, some things we got going on, and what our future looks like. So. Jason. <laughs> there, there we there. go. Okay, so these are some of the talks I'm going to talk about is the 2019 flood and how we recovered and responded, uh, current and upcoming projects we have, and the Clinton Marina as well. So as you all know, 2019, we had quite a, bit, quite a lot of rain in the spring, made our lake rise 23 feet higher than our normal elevation, expected a lot of areas like the marina itself, boat ramps, um, roads, things like that. So, and just so you guys know, our lake didn't return back to our normal uh, operational pool level until November of that year. So to kind of put that in perspective, this is what our boat ramp three looked like on the left. That's gonna be June of 2018 before the flood. Um, and on the right, it's June of 2019. As you see, our Northern parking lot in that area is completely underwater and the main area, um, where there's two boat ramp launching lanes uh, is completely underwater as well. And so this was pretty common at all of our boat ramps. Um, unfortunately, Google Earth didn't cooperate with the other boat ramps. So this is the best picture you got. So there's a lot of clouds on the other days. Uh, for the marina itself, this is kind of what they were dealing with on the left would be a typical holiday weekend, uh, what it looked like what people expected when they came to the marina. That was actually this last uh, 4th of July, I believe. And on the right is what they dealt with in the 2019 uh, flood year. And so that's a makeshift kind of walkway there. Um, Megan Hebert, she was the uh, manager at that time, did a really good job to still let people who had boats and stuff and operate and get out there, even though they had no power running water, things like that. So that's, this is actually on top of a hill on the right side. So just imagine you're going down from the stairs that you see on the left and it's all just parking lot underneath there. Uh, this is our Lake Henry. This is one of our trout ponds. Um, on the left is the pre-flood, how the parking lot looked. On the right is post-flood. So what occurred in this area was the soil underneath that parking lot got saturated from the water. Uh, it's kind of on a hill. So when that water left the hillside, kind of compromised the integrity of the parking lot itself, began to sink, crack, uh, and needs replaced. And then here's just some other pictures for you guys to look at. Uh, these are our boat ramps. This is on the left, it's boat ramp two. And that's um, from a boat when we were adjusting our wave brakes. Uh, that seemed like we were doing on a daily basis. Uh, but this is in boat ramp two facing the marina. And so you can kind of see on the right half of that picture, there's a little uh, triangle. Oops, sorry. Um, that's a, a bathroom facility completely underwater. So that wasn't uncommon to see. And on the right, that's boat ramp three that we saw earlier. That's completely underwater as well. Yeah. Was that bathroom facility? So what was that on? Sewer, septic? So that's uh, that's a, a vault toilet. Yeah. So luckily the core kind of let us know ahead of time that hey, the rains look like it's going to be flooding this year. We got all of everything pumped out. Um, it's still a, yeah. a vault toilet, but uh, we did the best we could. So Thank you. it still shocked me that there'd be some people fishing nearby, but uh, <laughs> I I told him probably not the best idea to eat that today, but it is what it is. All right, so these are some of the projects that stemmed from that, that rain event. Uh, replacing the parking lot, light poles, things you don't think about when, when flooding happens. Um, parking lot lights and area lights got, got really rusty, needed to replace just because we didn't want them to fall down and break and stuff like that. Replace our boat ramp bathroom doors. Uh, when I went and checked them, actually with Jeff Bender, we uh, opened up the first door and it fell off the hinges because it just got so rusted for being underwater for so long. Repair of Lake Henry, the parking lot, that's scheduled here coming up. 
And then we just got some other boat ramp parking lots that are that are needing some patchwork and replacement uh, from being underwater for so long. And I'm just going to talk a little bit on some current and upcoming projects we have. Uh, this is one that we got done for the 2021 season. So we have our kids fishing pond, which is inside of our day use area at the park. And one thing we noticed was uh, there's not much area around the pond itself that wheelchairs um, can easily get to and access for fishing. So we uh, worked with our engineering uh, division and got some plans made up and we ended up building it ourselves. Uh, and this is a complete ADA accessible fishing dock. Uh, so now individuals with disabilities that may need a wheelchair or something like that can still access fishing, which we thought was a really good improvement. We got it opened up for OK Kids Day, which we have in August each year. Uh, the group here uh, is actually Girl Scouts Love State Park. So didn't have a picture with uh, OK Kids Day, but it's been a really good and popular thing. A couple of our wildlife projects we got at the park. Uh, we started and, and put up six bat houses around the park just to help with declining bat populations. Uh, we still need to check them this year to see what the occupancy looks like. A really good program we started this year. Uh, we got two bee colonies. So we have two hives at the park and this will eventually turn into an interpretive program. We'll take some of the frames and go to schools, talk about pollinators, talk about honey things like that. And our big project that we've been working on this year is our archery range. Uh, beforehand, we had an archery range that really didn't have a shooting line, um, had five targets, and it just really needed some, some updated work. So been working with Aaron Austin with education and partnering with him and getting this going. And so on the picture here is what you'll, what we have right now. It's a 14 lane uh, covered shooting area. It's going to be um, ranging from 20, 10 yards for uh, youth targets and then going all the way out to 60 yards. It's going to have two lanes that are devoted for bring your own target if you want to bring a 3D target or crossbow. Uh, there is some other, hopefully, uh, more phases down the road, but as of now, until we get our uh, targets in they were going to get everything put in and have a grand opening so stay tuned for that uh, this should be really good like i said the range before really needed some help and, and this would be a really good addition all right and then i'm just going to touch a little bit on clinton marina hello uh so some history on the marina megan hebert purchased the marina in uh 1998 from the raton family Megan's actually here in the back. Megan, if you want to stand up real quick. So she owned and operated the marina. Um, and then in 2021, her niece, Aaron Carberry and Peter, may you see? Okay. Uh, are managing it now. So they're here as well. I just think the picture of Megan, uh, that's the year that she bought it, if I'm correct. And I just think that's a really cool picture. So the marina itself, um, 592 boat slips, 20 courtesy slips, 20 personal watercraft ports, boat rentals, food and beverage. Um, rumor has it they have the best pizza on the lake, which may, <laughs> might make you think how many people are selling pizza on the lake. And technically, it's just them, but <laughs> it's still good pizza. So, um, But we've been working really good with Peter and Aaron on uh, a lot of their vision, I'm not going to tell you all the things they have planned. I'll let them do that down the road. Um, but they're definitely uh, building off of Megan's legacy and really just showcasing what we have here at the lake and at the park. And that's pretty much I have what I'll have for you today, unless you guys have any questions. Are there any questions for Connor? Were those, uh, Connor, were those projects uh, federally funded avail or available for federal funding? So the Archer okay. Range is funded through Hunter's Ed. Uh, and then the uh, pollinators for bees, that was uh, funded through Wild Trust donations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the bat houses was across the state, which I, I couldn't tell you if that was federally funded or not. Mm -hmm. 
I was just curious for those infrastructure problems, you know, the, the parking lot and the, oh, okay. Vault, sorry. Those things like that. I don't know if they were ARPA eligible or not. Yeah. I'm sorry. The, uh, uh, products related to the flooding in 2019, those are going through FEMA. Okay. And so those are FEMA funded. Okay. Mr. Chair, if I might follow up, good, it's a good question. Talk about timing of, of FEMA um, payments. Uh, that's been a change since, you know, our previous experience with FEMA, would you Connor? Yeah. So I'm, I, uh, for us, um, although we were 23 feet high, our state park really didn't suffer nearly as much as some other state parks. Our uh, campgrounds are higher up on bluffs. We didn't have some of those facilities that were not in use. So um, we've kind of been able to, to last uh, without having to need as much funding right now. And so we're getting to the point where now we're getting um, some of those projects done just because some of these other bigger parks that had some lot major more issues uh, needed their, their stuff done first. I answer your question. All I have to say is being one who fishes in the winter, I appreciate it when after it snows, you get out there and clean the roads. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a, a few guides uh, as well. So we try to run through the boat ramp parking lots because even if it's still snowing there, they'll launch out there. And it, it's noticed and appreciated. Is there any other questions for Connor? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, the commercial harvest of mussels. Who has Good afternoon. That? Jordan. There he is. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Chair and Commission. Commission. Trying to get my screen Trying shared screen here. Here. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'll be uh, pretty brief here. Today, but, uh, I just wanted to talk to you about uh, the muscle harvest regulations that I spoke with you about at the last commission meeting. Um, just a quick history of muscle harvest regulation in the state. Um, previously, these muscles were used in the pearl button industry and for cultured pearl production. Um, historically, we've had four native species permitted for harvest and one non-native species. Uh, since uh, the beginning of 2003, we've had a moratorium on this commercial muscle harvest. And that moratorium lasted for 10 years, was extended one time, and is set to sunset uh, at the very beginning of next year. So we've seen some pretty good results from the moratorium. We've seen an increase in some previously harvested mussels such as the monkey face, and it's also prevented the decline of other mussel species. But uh, we do have some species like the three ridge that just seem to have not recovered yet from that harvest. So looking around uh, at our neighboring states, um, Oklahoma and Arkansas still allow commercial harvest, but there really is not a market to be said. Um, Missouri uh, removed regulations allowing harvest in 2009 and Nebraska also does not allow commercial harvest. And we have a number of concerns with commercial harvest in Kansas. Uh, mussels often have pretty specific habitat requirements, which leads to concentrations of those mussels, which then can lead to concentrated harvest. And mussels, based on their complex life histories, often have very sporadic recruitment. So conditions have to be just right for spawning and uh, reproduction and recruitment. And there's a lot of old and new threats that mussels face. Um, you know, some of the new ones you might consider aquatic nuisance species um, and climate change. And uh, 
potentially emerging muscle virus that's um, wreaking havoc in some places in the Eastern US. Um, commercial harvest could also be a concern during regulatory listing processes, um, you know, in both state and federal versions of Endangered Species Act, uh, commercial harvest is a, is a point that has to be addressed in that listing process. So by removing it, um, that helps to alleviate that concern. Uh, mussels are also pretty difficult to identify. Um, a lot of species look very similar and at the very same time, the same species may look different from another um, individual of the same species. So they're, they're pretty tough to tell apart. Um, also, regulation compliance was extremely lacking in previous harvest reporting. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but there were thousands and thousands of pounds of mussels harvested in the past that went unreported. Um, as I said before, there's just no market for it anymore. Um, they've, they've shifted techniques over in, um, over in Asia where the, the mussels were historically shipped to produce pearls. Um, they've shifted techniques, so that's not needed anymore. They have their own, own uh, material they can use. Um, and all these things to say uh, that uh, the practice of commercial harvest is very unsustainable. So the changes we're proposing are to replace the five existing regulations listed here um, related to the harvest, salvage, and sale of freshwater mussels. Um, so those are um, harvest and, and buyer permits, basically, uh, to replace those with one regulation that explicitly prohibits the uh, commercial harvest, salvage, and sale of freshwater mussels. And that's all that I have. I have a question. How long does a mussel live? That depends very much on what species you're talking about. Um, so some of the thinner shelled species will, you know, only live five or six years. They grow much faster. Um, but say like a, a washboard mussel that gets very large and can be upwards of, you know, I don't know, five, 10 pounds, um, those will live over a hundred years. But in many cases, it takes a long time of having that right breeding it, season yep. to be able, 10 years is a short time when it comes to muscles re, rebounding in numbers. Yeah, it, it might be, uh, you know, for that mussel that might live 100 years, they may only get the right conditions to have a successful year class, you know, 10 or 12 times if, if the water conditions and temperatures and host fish are all, all just right. Are there any other questions for Jordan? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have fishing regulations. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, we workshopped these, or this was part of the general discussion in April and none of the language has changed on the fish regulation changes that we're gonna do, that we're gonna workshop here tonight. And I believe we workshopped this one more time. But. Um, the first item to discuss is changes to the reference document, which outlines the length and crew limit changes uh, at individual impoundments that differ than the statewide regulations. And so um, th these are the changes proposed for the 2023 calendar year. And, and I'm just gonna highlight some, they've been in your, they're in your briefing book, but some of the, just a little bit more contentious ones here are uh, 10 inch minimum link limit at Cedar Bluff. We wanna remove that. We instituted that in 2018 based on a response of uh, poor recruitment and, um, and, and rapid growth. Well, conditions have changed since the lake 
uh, filled up in 2019 and uh, growth has slowed a little bit. Encruitment has improved. So there's, there's more smaller fish competing for less resources. And there just isn't that many 10 inch fish um, showing up in angler creels. So they wanna remove that 10 inch length limit and allow harvest of some of those smaller fish. And the next one on, any questions on that one? The next one on here is uh, proposing a six to nine inch protective slot on bluegill and other sunfish at Antelope Lake in Graham County. We have four experimental populations where we're trying this right now. And this will be, I believe this will be our fifth. Um, it's just part of an adaptive research project to determine if reducing harvest at these sizes, that six to nine inch size range has the potential to increase those size structures. We have very little uh, eight inch bluegill in a lot of our public impoundments. And we're just trying to see, trying different things to see if we can increase growth on some of them. But anyway, any questions on that one? Okay, Pomona and Melbourne reservoirs, we're proposing an 18 inch minimum length limit on Sawguy. That one has had an 18 inch limit on walleye for several years now. And we've started stocking Sawguy as part of a research project to see if they do any better than the walleye we've been stocking there. And since we have both species, we want them to be the same minimum length limit. So we're just proposing to clean that up and change it to 18. Okay, that's, that's the main ones for the reference document, unless you want me to list all of them. No, are there any questions on that so far? Okay, go on. Okay, the other proposed regulation change, the first one I have here is KAR 115.74, uh, fish processing and possession. We wanna change this regulation to read each person who takes any fish, um, and then here's the wording we wanna change, with a statewide length limit or a water body specific length limit from a water body shall, receive, shall leave the head, body and tail fin attached while the person is, possession, is in possession of those fish on the water. So we just wanted to make sure that, um, that we're allowing gizzard shad as cut bait, you know, for, for channel cat, blue cat. Um, people were doing this in the past and it was just kind of an oversight that we didn't, didn't catch that. So we're just trying to clean up that language. So if they have a statewide length limit, then, then you, you need to leave the head, body and tail fin attached to be legal. That's it for that one. Okay, go on. Okay. The next change is in response to allow for the use of umbrella rigs with up to five hooks. Um, and as I mentioned, the general discussion in April, we felt that the use of umbrella rigs with five hooks is not likely to have population, population level effects of any particular species. And we haven't seen any scientific research to the contrary to this point and that issues from snagging. There have been some uh, cases of, of people being successful snagging fish, um, not necessarily on purpose, but you know, just having that many hooks out there with wipers, white bass, those sorts of things. But we feel that that's covered adequately in other regulations that uh, restrict snagging as, as a means to capture fish and require the release of fish that are accidentally snagged outside the mouth. So um, with those two things together, we feel that, that the, the language I'm about to mention kind of will allow for the use of umbrella rigs in a fairly safe way that doesn't affect the population. And so the first change would be to KAR 115.11 definitions, uh, definition of an artificial lure. It means a man-made fishing device made of artificial or non-edible natural materials used to mimic prey. And we want to change the, the language as follows that Devices mimicking individual prey shall be limited to no more than three hooks and devices mimicking multiple prey shall be limited to no more than five hooks. And so if you're using an umbrella rig, that would be mimicking multiple prey and you could use up to five hooks. Any questions on that one? I'll move on to 115.71. Go ahead. Okay, 115.71. Um, fishing, legal equipment, methods of taking, and other provisions. We want to change this regulation to fishing lines with not more than two baited hooks or artificial lures per line. The latter, meaning artificial lures, shall not exceed six hooks per line. So with that one, essentially, 
you could still have two baited hooks per line, or if you're using two artificial lures, you would not be able to use two umbrella rigs because it would be over that six hook limit. Not like I mentioned before, it's not like anybody would do that, but that would keep them from using up to two umbrella rigs or more than six hooks. Any questions so far on any of these? If not, you have a couple more. I do. Uh, the next one deals with commercial fish bait, 115.17.3. Um, I, I forgot to have Sheila exclude this one again, but uh, please disregard 115.17.2. There's no changes requested on that. So I'll move on to 17.3. Uh, commercial fish bait permit requirement application and general provi provisions. We essentially want to change some language in A there that a commercial fish bait permit shall be required for the harvest, sale, or purchase for resale of fish bait, except that a commercial fish bait permit shall not be required for, um, and typically this would just say annelids and insects, we want to add in non-living commercially packaged fish bait. Um, this has been going on for a while, and we don't we don't want to have like stores such as Walmart have to get deal with these commercial fish bait permits all over the state when they're just selling dead fish. So I would kind of simplify that a little bit. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, next one is one fifteen seven ten fishing special provisions. We want to remove the term Asian carp uh, throughout and replace it with silver and big head carp, just to be a little more specific. Um, and another one is add rusty crayfish to the prohibited species list uh, and add McPherson State Lake to the list for rusty crayfish. Um, rusty crayfish were collected last summer in 2021 at McPherson State Fishing Lake. But prior to that, we had no records of them here. It's always been something that we were worried about, but or mildly worried about and we did start some crayfish surveys and collected our first individuals in mcpherson state lake so and the last one on there for 115 710 is add lebo city lake to our uh, kansas aquatic nuisance species designated waters due to zebra mussel infestation in 2021 okay last one is trout water changes uh, King Lake and Emporia, we're going to add as a type one trout water. Uh, OJ Watson Park in, is that, I think that's Wichita. Yeah. Add as a type one trout water and Wichita K. East, we want to remove from trout waters list. So we're switching over to OJ Watson Park as, as opposed to K. East. I think that might be a better opportunity. We'll try it out. Um, and just to reiterate, type one water means any trout location where an angler will need a trout stamp to fish during the trout season. So these are typically locations where most of the angling pressure, we're pretty confident it'll be trout anglers. Are there any questions on any of these? What are the next steps again, Ryan, for these? We're going to workshop it one more time. One more time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, Matt Peak, fur bear biologist from the Emporia Research and Survey Office. I've got three changes to propose today to the fur bear regulations. The first one is in KR 115.51. And we're proposing to allow the use of laser sights to take fur bearers that are treed with the aid of dogs. The second two proposed changes are in 115.25.11. Um, the first one is to extend the general fur bearer season, which currently ends on February 15th through the last day of February. So that will extend the total uh, season out for most fur bearers to be approximately three and a half months during most years, of course, the opening day varies just a little bit there, uh, depending on, you know, the what days, the uh, calendar days, the years are, are, are by year. And then the third change is to, um, we're recommending increasing the otter 
season bag limit from five otters to 10 otters. And then uh, with that, we would propose increasing the bag limit from five to 10 on the lower Neosho and Meridazine um, otter management units. And we would increase the bag limits from two to five on the Vertigris and Missouri units. And of course, those units are shown there in your briefing book. Um, I guess I could say about the fur bearer season dates, we've, we've, um, we talked about this in a little more detail at a previous meeting, but um, I understand this was a, a, a topic of conversation this morning to a fairly high degree. And I would ask the question to a lot of people who are wanting longer harvest seasons, how many of them are using the harvest seasons we have now to the extent they're available? We've always used the harvest season with fur bearers and a lot of other species as a time to address uh, damage issues or perceived overpopulations in certain areas. And so I want to be clear that um, we would still view the legal harvest season as the main time in which people who think that there are too many fur bearers should be doing something about it. And so we don't need to necessarily extend the season for those people to be able to address their problems. They've got three months and now we're proposing three and a half months that they could already do that. And so our intent is not to stand in anybody's way who wants to harvest more raccoons or wants to address raccoon or other fur bear populations on their property. So with that, I'll turn this back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Matt? Did a good job. All right, thank you. According to my agenda, that's all that's on the agenda for the afternoon session. So unless there's any questions or comments from anybody, is there any questions or comments from the audience? Okay. Uh, I will remind you to write down who you are if you're a guest here. I should have reminded you earlier if you are a guest and have it signed in, please do that. It helps uh, Sheila keep track of attendance and this type of thing. I'm going to recess the meeting and it will reconvene at 
I want to reconvene this meeting. And I want to start with the reintroduction of commissioners and staff, starting on my left. Aaron Ryder, Columbus. Bill Escarino, Garden City. I'm Gerald Lauber from Topeka. Lauren Quayle Sill, Hutchison. Emmerich Cross, Kansas City. Troy Spore, Oakley. Warren Gefeller, Russell. Sheila Camus, Commission Support. Jason Dixon, Commissioner Support. Brad Loveless, Secretary. Dan Riley, Chief Counsel. Okay. At this meeting, we will have any public comment on non agenda items. Does anybody have anything they'd like to discuss? I do have one online, Chairman. Okay. Buck, I'm asking you to unmute, so you should be unmuting. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah can, you, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes, uh, yes sir. Um, first, I'd like to thank the commission for allowing me this opportunity to kind of, I don't know, just give my a, a point of view that I have. Um, I've, I've hunted in Kansas, uh, I don't know, probably uh, 20, 20 years or more. Um, I've, always, um, I've always hunted public land um, and, you know, enjoyed coming up there to y'all state. It's a, you know, have a great thing going up there with your wildlife program and stuff. Uh, you know, uh, as much as I would like to, I, I would like to go be able to afford to go with an outfitter, but it's just, you know, not possible you know, it, you know, to do that. Um, this year I put in, didn't get drawn, usually always get drawn. Uh, you know, uh, this year I did not. And when I was kind of checking with them to see if I got drawn or whatever, I said, well, you know, they'll be sending the check, the refund for the, for my permit. And, you know, they, I know they keep, I don't know, 20 something dollars or whatever to, you know, um, for, for putting in for the draw. Um, and you know, to get the money back for the hunt license. Well, I was told this year that the hunt license, they're, uh, they're not gonna, they're not going to, uh, refund that. And, uh, you know, I just wish it y'all kind of reconsider that. I mean, I know it's, you know, 90, I think 90 something dollars. Uh, I didn't realize that when I put in, um, uh, for the permit that, you know, I knew that I would have to pay the 20 something dollars for, to put in for it as usual. I did not realize that, you know, that they were going to keep my money for my hunt license that I can't use. And, and I kind of played my case with the, some of the, you know, people that I talked to in the Pratt office. Uh, and, you know, I told them, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I wish I'd have known this. And they said, well, they're trying to encourage you to come up, you know, uh, they're trying to encourage people to come up do other type of hunting, waterfowl hunting, upland bird, uh, upland game birds, stuff, st things of that nature. And I told her, I said, you know, I, I just my budget to drive all the way up there, thirteen hours, you know, from driving from southeast Texas all the way up to, you know, all the way up there is it's a, it's, it's especially with fuel prices being, you know, diesel five six dollars a gallon, you know, I just I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, I can't, um, I can't spend that kind of money just to go up there. And I wish that they would kind of, y'all would kind of reconsider something. I mean, I'm a public land hunter and I feel like the public land hunting uh, y'all have is outstanding. Uh, everybody I've ever made contact, game wardens, uh, people that were over the, uh, the refuges, you know, that I've hunted have always been, top-notch, you know, very good people and all that. The reason I'm hunting public land, I guess you could say, is, is the money issue as far as not being able to go with the outfitter. So every little bit counts, especially nowadays with the price of everything's getting to be. Um, I'm just wishing y'all would kind of reconsider that, keeping that money for those hunting licenses. Um, you know, I, I feel like hunting license, public hunting land also to me is – the blue collar guy, that's his last hope as far as used to, you could go hunt properties, you know, 
it didn't cost that much. Even around here in Texas, now you can't go hunt anybody's property unless you've got a pocket full of money. And I don't blame the landowner for that. I really don't. But I just wish it don't. I mean, keeping the hunting license, that 90-something dollars for that hunting license that I'm not going to use now is it's kind of a it's kind of a it's a poke at the at the blue collar guy now i know everybody's everybody's gonna have to do that to put in for it i mean that's just the way it is but you know i just wish y'all could kind of reconsider on something like that because you know 90 you know 90 something bucks is a, is a lot to me and uh, i just want to kind of plead my case on it and you know get your thoughts on it as well and like i said i'm a public land hunter and it, the only reason I'm, put, I'm hunting public land is, I mean, doing it the hard way. Don't get me wrong. I've harvested some nice, nice white-tail deer in, in your state. And it's, I mean, I, I wish one day, you know, when I do get ready to retire, I've, you know, I've got 30 years in with the city. And one day I hope to retire and, and move to Kansas. I, lo- I love it up there. But I just wish y'all would maybe kind of reconsider something on, on, on the, uh, the, the keeping of the hunting license that I'm not going to use this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, This is something that is not uncommon among a lot of other states. And to eliminate any confusion, we made a a concerted effort to try to disclose uh, that on the application process. Uh, we'll hear what you have to say. I don't have an immediate response as to what you should do next. Yes, sir. Uh, I appreciate your comments. I don't know if anybody else here has anything they want to add, Brad. Yep. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I'm Brad Lovell, Secretary. So, yeah, um, anticipating this conversation, as two um, staff members, uh, Jessica Mounts, who's, who's on Zoom, and Levi, if they wanted to characterize um, a couple aspects of this decision that we we made and how we got the information out. So if you'd be interested in that, they can pretty quickly help help you understand what kind of the atmosphere is in other states. And then also how we went through the process of notifying our customers, if you'd be interested. Mr. Chair, is that, is that something you'd like to hear? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Well, how about if we start with the background, Levi, if you want to share what that is, and then we'll go to Jessica next. <coughs> Levi Jaster, Emporia, Kansas. I am the Big Game Program Coordinator. Um, so I went through uh, all the states that had a deer tag that they had on a limited draw, um, commonly or the best I could um, <coughs> yesterday into the evening. And I got, got through 17 states. And in going through that, some many states are unclear as to how they handle that. Most of the refund information is um, based on uh, somebody that actually got a tag and then can't come to hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but in going through that, there are nine states that definitively said they don't refund tags three states that uh as best i could tell without contacting them uh directly to ask for certain that also don't so that would be 12 states that do not there is only one state that does um and that's iowa except that they also then take out a 60 dollar and 50 point preference point fee, 50 cent preference point fee. Um, And then there are a couple states that uh, they don't require a hunting license that is in the cost of the deer permit. Um, So they're not kind of, they're different from everybody. And then a couple of states that uh, are kind of sort of, um, notably is Nevada in that they will refund the license fee, but you don't get any bonus points if you do that. Whereas if you want the bonus point, then they do not refund the license fee. Um, And then just to also make a note on some of these states uh, that I think would be of interest, 
is that several of the states, um, seven states have a higher hunting license fee than we do. Uh, one of those is Iowa. So you get half of that back minus, you know, about half for that preference point. And then the other states, um, all the other states that have higher than we do, um, we're at 97. Uh, California stood out as the highest at 188.74. Um, several states also require non-residents to buy not just a hunting license, but a hunting license, fishing license combo. There is no non-resident annual hunting license available. Um, and uh, in running through some of these, uh, what stood out was the message that they uh, put in place. Um, California's was probably the most direct of this is not refundable. Um, thank you for supporting conservation. That's what you're investing in with this. Um, and those that do keep that fee also tended to have, um, lower application fees is what it seemed like. Um, or they did not add on a bunch of additional stamps and fees that other states that did not did. And many times in those other cases, when they added of additional stamps, like, uh, the Dakotas usually had like a habitat stamp or conservation mm -hmm. stamp. Um, none of those were refundable either. Okay. So, and, and of all those, uh, Kansas far and away has the highest draw rate. Um, coming in several states, I could not calculate it because they did not do a statewide, um, but our statewide draw odds are 73% versus Iowa's next closest of about 55%, although I noticed in looking at their draw odds, um, it tends to be that people that don't, that only have uh, zero, one, two to three points aren't putting in at the rate mm. you would expect um, for the number of those. Mostly people are waiting to actually try to draw until they have enough. Other than that, most states are in the, you know, 30% came up a few times, including some are 10. Um, Utah on their limited, uh, like their very limited entry, or even less than a percent. Wow. So, okay. Uh, okay. So that, thank you, Levi. Okay. And so that's kind of the background uh, for the benefit of the commissioners and our our guests. Um, we realized that the, far and away the majority of folks were keeping those license fees. So we said that seems appropriate. So then that goes to Jessica and how you shared that information, Jessica. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Jessica Mounts, Director of Licensing. Buck, thank you so much for um, popping into the, to the meeting tonight. Um, I, I know you talked with several of the team and Pratt, um, just as you mentioned, and I want to commend you on, on how politely, um, how politely you spoke with them and, uh, and just, you know, for, for sharing your story and, and the reasons why you hunt. I mean, that's why, that's why we're here tonight is, is because folks like you. So um, really appreciate you showing up. Um, I can tell you that this wasn't, this wasn't an easy decision and it's one that we involved the whole agency in over the course of several months. And we did some research on the background and what other states were doing. And we took a look at the workload that it was causing, you know, to just do all those refunds. And, and, um, and we, we tried to just make a little bit more of a case for allowing, um, allowing us to serve customers who, who legitimately had an emergency develop that they just, you know, weren't able to use their permit. Um, but we did, in order to serve those folks and make sure that, they, that we can do that, we did have to make some concessions. And, and part of that is, um, is, is going to affect folks like you. But just as Levi said, the state of Kansas uses every single dollar of that hunting license to support wildlife, wildlife conservation, the opportunity to hunt for generations to come, especially on our public lands. And as a public land hunter, um, you know that um, Kansas is is ninety percent privately owned, and so those those little tiny um, you know by by ratios by comparison, those little tiny areas are just so important um, yes, to provide. Old nuggets. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I I am curious, Buck. Though I I'm wondering if you have thought about um, going ahead and coming to Kansas during doe season. Um, and purchasing an antlerless tag over the counter. 
um, because you're still able to do that. Your hunting license is still good for all 365 days it was before. I know it's a trip, but you know, if if you do want to take advantage of our public lands and you do want to harvest an animal this year, um, that is that is one solution that we could that uh, that you could have. <laughs> well, that that's good to know. Um, I, I I was under the impression, of course, even like last last year or when I put in for the draw, um, I should have researched a little more. This year, with fuel prices and you know. I even was kind of reluctant if I even did get drawed this year. My wife's uncle, uh, he went up, I brought him up last year. He had never been there. And and we were out at the Pratt unit, which that's that's where I go. I, I love going to Pratt or Texas Lake. And um, I brought my wife's uncle up there and he went up, you know, he went up there with me. And, um, you, know, um, you know, I noticed that deer numbers were down from what, out there from what they used to be when I first started. Um, but he wanted to go, you know, try it out. And I told him, I said, hey, man, it ain't as easy as it used to be, you know, but, you know, it's still a, you know, experience, you know, um, the whole ball of wax, getting to see all the wildlife and stuff that you see. Um, <clears throat> and I, I would have, I, I was kind of reluctant because of the fuel prices, the way they were, and it was kind of tight. Even I was kind of shocked because I, actually I've been very blessed. I've gotten drawed every time I've put in, which through the years is, you know, I, I've been extremely blessed, you know, to get drawed. This is the first year and it just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of got me whenever this is the first year I didn't get drawed and I didn't get, you know, I'm losing out, you know, on, you know, a hundred, you know, right at a hundred bucks. And, you know, next year I know, but this year's times are kind of, Things are kind of tight. I was even reluctant about even putting in, um, you know, but went ahead and put in because my wife's uncle wanted to go back. He's like, hey, I want to go back. He didn't even get to kill a deer. He didn't kill a deer. He had opportunity. He's seen some nice, uh, two nice eight points and a couple other deer that he were. I'm a real big on trying to shoot mature deer, not shoot the juveniles, let them grow. Um, but he enjoyed it and he wanted to go back as well. We always go back, at, you know, it's during muzzle loader season is when we go. Um, but I thought since I didn't get drawn that, Hey, that's, that's the end of it. You don't get to. So that might be something that I could talk to him and maybe me and him could, you know, split fuel or something to maybe go get a dough because the meat is a big thing as far as, man, uh, I will say this, that's the best eating deer meat that, uh, that I've ever eaten in my life is when I started hunting up there. It's, you know, the, them deer eating on crops and man, it's just, quality deer meat <laughs> it's really good but um i did i wasn't aware that i could go up and actually shoot a doe uh I may consider it kind of see how the fuel prices and how things go with finances uh and kind of go from there but that, that is good to know that i'll get i will kick that around and 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 see if that's something that i can afford uh during during the muzzleloader season okay thank you any Sorry. other public comment? And again, hey, uh, are y'all still there? Can I still? Hello? Yes. Yep, yes. you're good. Hey, I just want to thank the commission again and 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 for letting me. I mean, I came, I told somebody the other day, I said, man, I almost feel bad being out of state complaining about something like this. Because I do know what other states charge, but I have to weigh it and say, okay how much is this trip going to cost me? How much is this license going to cost me? You know, if I do get drawed, if I don't get drawed, I had to weigh all that, you know, all, you know, that's kind of the blue collar type mentality. I guess you got to kind of weigh it in the balance and see what's worth. And I really enjoy hunting that state. And uh, like I said, you know, everybody I've come in contact from the people I call in the office at Pratt to the commission to, you know, everybody has been top notch and, I highly respect you guys for what y'all are doing with y'all's wildlife. And, you know, I would love to see y'all Zoom meetings and the decisions. I mean, earlier today, y'all were talking about the turkey. Well, that's something I wanted to do really bad, to come up turkey hunt. But it's like I said, it's driving all the way up there to shoot a turkey is kind of tough, you know, because, you know, it's 13 hours for me. But, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I love this deal that y'all have going on with this 
these meetings like this, talking about what's best for the wildlife and, and your and your uh, and your properties that the state has. And thanks again for allowing me to speak. Thank you, hey, Mr. Chair. One other comment: Levi said he has some additional information to pass on. So if we can get his contact information, Levi, I'd like to follow up with him. If that's all right. So Jason, you might just try to communicate with him about getting. Yep, I can. Okay, great. great. Thanks, so good. And good. Shannon knows his stuff too. So any more public comment on non-agenda items? Sure. Well, I came tonight to discuss the status of the uh, recovery of the black-footed ferret in Kansas. Uh, as you probably already know, we have a recovery site operated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and supported by stakeholders across the state, including the state of Kansas, who's provided a lot of personnel and technical expertise, as well as uh, equipment to uh, the project that is operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the site is a 10,000 acre site out in Logan County. And, um, and that site has been going now since 2007. Uh, I'm with Prairie Park Nature Center. My name is Marty Burrell and I'm the nature education supervisor there. And one of the many biologists through the state who offers services of volunteer nature to help support surveying and doing wildlife education around short grass prairies in Kansas, prairie habitat, um, prairie dogs, and the recovery of the black-footed ferret. We believe that they're all tied in together. Uh, the black-footed ferret is a great poster child for the endangered species program and one that has been especially successful here in Kansas, largely through the efforts of not only the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but also the many stakeholders, the zoos, the nature centers, the state, um, the uh, organizations such as Audubon of Kansas and Defenders of Wildlife. Um, this program has been especially successful as it's been described to me by the recovery program's head, Pete Gober, and their education specialist, Kimberly Frazier, uh, because of the following points. One is that it's the only site in the United States that is plague free. Plague is one of the things that has caused prairie dog uh, populations to fail and black-footed ferrets to be uh, as critically endangered as they are. Kansas is the only plague-free site. We have very little public land, but this is a viable site that has proven to be extraordinarily successful because reproduction has been uh, documented every single year since its inception in 2007. Um, this site is uh, supported by literally hundreds of people who have engaged in surveying, uh, corporations who have supported it, the state has supported it, uh, universities and other organizations such as mine have contributed their staff towards supporting this recovery program. It is now and has been in the past threatened by a small but vocal group in Logan County who do not support it. And in the last two years, that group has become more vocal and has uh, once again uh, challenged the site by insisting that the family who lives there, the Haverfield family who now runs the farm, uh, the initial landowner, Larry Haverfield died a few years ago. It's now being operated by his two sons and daughter as Butte Creek Farm. And they've added a little bit of, uh, of habitat to their recovery site um, through their own land ownership. Um, the county is now reorganizing to try and oppose any further development of this recovery site. And the family is very concerned uh, that um, the support will be lost and the recovery efforts will fail. Uh, we have 
uh, chatted with um, defenders of wildlife who are acting as liaison with the family and also with the US Fish and Wildlife Service sent letters of support. One of the things that came about through our discussions is that other states such as Utah, Colorado, Wyoming have gotten a bolster in the support for the, their recovery sites by having their states develop working groups. Working groups that work in conjunction closely with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a coordinated plan whereby their states can use their biologists and their other, um, their other essential resources to help the recovery plan. They, those states have developed uh, working plans that are consistent with, in conjunction with the US Fish and Wildlife Service's goals. And we think that it would be a great idea for the state of Kansas to develop such a working group. The state is already, you know, it has been very supportive, but this will add additional support and hopefully protection for the recovery site. You know, this recovery site has generated a great deal of interest in Kansas. I know I'm one of those displays that displays a black-footed ferret just a few blocks from here and the efforts that have gone in to making this recovery site a success. <coughs> As I said, the black-footed ferret is, uh, is a poster child for short grass prairie conservation. And the, you know, the, the protection and conservation of black-tailed prairie dogs, which are a keystone species in our state. They support literally dozens of other species. And that site is no different. It is a rich environment that needs to be protected. And the site has generated a lot of support across the entire st uh, state. Even our own state naturalists, such as Milford Nature Center, have gone out and done education programs in Logan County with literally hundreds of people coming out to listen. So, it's not all of Logan County that doesn't want this site. It's a very small group of people who don't support endangered species being returned uh, to the land. Kansas has very little public land to contribute to recovery sites. We're dependent upon individual landowners and these landowners have successfully uh, supported this program since 2007 and want to continue to do so. Uh, through whatever you know, decisions that have been made currently this year, as far as I know, there will be no allocation of, uh, of, uh, of new ferrets to the site. Um, how that decision came to be or if that decision is actually final, I don't know exactly. But uh, the allocations to the site occur as young ferrets at the Conservation Center in Colorado are available and biologists determine that adequate habitat on the recovery site is uh, suitable for new ferrets to be introduced. That is necessary for the ongoing success of the program. You know, without support of, of that, uh, it's feared that the site will fail. And after 15 years, it would be a sad state of affairs to see a very successful site fail. So we're asking that we work with the state, the stakeholders, the family, all of those people with a vested interest in this to help bolster this project and, uh, and to see the state throw its weight behind through assistance of its biologists and the development of a working group that will, um, that will help protect the recovery program here in Kansas. It's the only one we have. It's a very, very important program. And, uh, and we have five live display education programs here in Kansas that are supporting this education throughout the entire state with the sixth one coming online very soon. So there's a lot of interest in it. And we hope that 
the Department of Wildlife and Parks will seriously consider putting together a working group. The working groups in Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, all develop these working plans that, that have very similar goals, but are tailored to the individual state and the sites that they have. The sites are all somewhat different. And so they need to be tailored. We know that would require effort, but it doesn't, as, as far as you know, I understand wouldn't require additional personnel that already are doing jobs like habitat surveys, land uh, owner uh, contacts and um, helping them to uh, meet those goals in a variety of different ways. So that's a proposal we're putting before the commission today and hoping that you will consider it, um, look into it and, and hopefully um, you know, throw your weight at least behind the uh, continued support of our recovery site here in Kansas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we go on to any more public comment on non agenda items, before we go on to the workshop session, I want to thank Aaron Ryder for his contribution for the last few years. Uh, he, this is going to be his last meeting on the commission. Uh, we've got some cookies to celebrate his departure, I guess. Uh, I have mixed emotions. He doesn't have to make the long trip as much, and we're going to miss him. So that's my two cents worth. And thanks for all your time and contribution, Aaron. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it's been a great ride. I've enjoyed it immensely and met a a lot of great people and uh, I've enjoyed discussing the passions of the outdoors um, and seeing a lot of the, the great state of Kansas. So uh, I appreciate everything that, uh, um, that I've learned from it and, and will cherish this time uh, many years from now, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm Brad Lovell, Secretary Ike. I want to also express my gratitude toward Aaron for the good work he's done. We've had great conversations. He's fully invested in the outdoor resources of Kansas and been a great advocate for that. If it would be okay, Mr. Chair, since my wife stayed up till midnight last night making these cookies, can we take a quick break so people can share them? Sure. They're up front. Okay. Well, I've already had one, but I'm probably going to have another one. Yeah. Oh, did you? They are good. Well, tell your wife, thank you. Yeah. That was unnecessary.
Thank you very much, Chairman, Lobby, and Commissioners. I uh, came up for the cookie, but while I'm here, I think I'd talk a little bit about webless migratory birds today. <laughs> um, so the regulation I'm talking about today is a proposed change to KAR 115-2520, and that is our regulation that pertains to the hunting of sandhill cranes. The proposed change is a relatively straightforward change. It would clarify the requirement of completing our online sandhill crane identification test prior to hunting versus prior to purchasing that sandhill crane hunting permit that we have in place. Um, so the recommended change that we have would better align with the workflow of our new online uh, licensing and permit purchasing platform. And it still maintains the uh, requirement of completing that test prior to actually uh, heading out in the field and hunting, which is the intent of, of the regulation. Um, so it's a pretty relatively straightforward change uh, to that regulation. This is one of those regulations that um, we heard a good summary from Dan earlier about some things getting caught up in the process. And I've been here for a few meetings now, and I may be, who are hopeful, maybe next meeting on this one. But we'll see how things develop on that. So um, anyway, it, it is uh, something we're, we're hoping to get through. Uh, sometime soon, but I just want to give you a kind of a heads up on the timelines to TBD at this point still. But no, with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions you may have. Any questions for Rich? There won't be any questions to applicants about having, I mean, they can't say, well, oh, I didn't, I've got my license. Yeah, I no. I mean, it'll yep. be. Absolutely. Like, like, In fact, I think I would uh, call the, this clarification makes it even more of a straightforward process than it would be previously. Yeah, so it would help with that clarification rather than restrict okay thank you very much thank you Third. good evening mr chairman and commissioners excuse me was hoping the secretary would have brought milk to go with the cookies. <laughs> okay, this evening we're gonna be talking about several public lands regulations again. And I noticed this morning, um, if you'll notice on your briefing book item at the top, it says workshop session number two. I forgot to change that number. This is actually workshop session number three. And like Rich, I'm hoping that Dan will vote on these in the August meeting is the plan. Ah, uh, they're going to have to have 60 days notice because these, these are regular. Okay. Terms. So maybe not. It'll probably be more like September at least. Okay. Because, Stuart, those actually haven't been introduced into the system yet because we've got a batch in there right now, which what? is the, the ones that Rich just presented on are in there and hopefully to the AG's office. Yours will be in the next batch after that. Okay. Along with those muscles regulations that we okay. talked about earlier. So. So okay. Fast enough. What's that? So fast enough, September. Well, yeah. I mean, the hunting season will have started by then, but we have to go by the process. So. I mean, and if there's ever a time when it's necessary, we can we can get emergency regs. Also, that's the the people in the process don't like that, but if it's genuinely an emergency, that's another option. Um, you we I, we you can discuss. Can yes. That, yeah. Okay, so let's start off with the baiting regulation, uh, KAR 115.823. This one's pretty straightforward, just to, to recap. Um, the prior language, we're just amending the, the language of this regulation. The prior language uh, stated that no person shall place, deposit, expose, or scatter bait while hunting or preparing to hunt on department lands. And we found, our officers found that people were using this as, as a way to uh, because of this language, still place bait on, on department lands under the guise that they were uh, taking pictures of wildlife or viewing wildlife, So, but yet hunting over it. So um, we're just changing it to be simple language that no person shall place deposit or expose or scatter bait on department lands, period, mm -hmm. for any reason. So, And this, again, always applies to, to walk-in and IWEHA properties that adopt our public lands regulations. And this would not affect licensed fur harvesters that trap on, on public lands at all. So with that, I'd take any questions on this regulation. Any questions? Moving on to camping, KAR 115.8-9. You remember we were made recommendations on this one because of the ever-growing problem with, with homeless uh, folks taking up residency at a lot of our, our 
state fishing lakes and wildlife area campgrounds. And um, so as a measure to try to uh, minimize that, we're recommending that, that um, the extended or the consecutive days allowed to camp at our state fishing lakes and wildlife areas um, be reduced from 14 consec consecutive days to seven. Um, this would not affect state parks whatsoever. This is a state fishing lake and wildlife area specific regulation change. Um, this, the language of the, of the amendment would still allow managers on site to either post a property as, as still allowing 14 day camping or written approval could be given to a, a family that wants to camp more than seven consecutive days at a state fishing lake over the summer. So we still have some flexibility with, with this. So that's the camping regulation in a nutshell. And I'd take any questions on that one. Stuart, is this the second workshop too, or is that? The, these are all number three. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry about That's that. Okay. okay, go on. All right, the third one, KR 115.8-25. This is actually a new proposed uh, public lands regulation. This is a, the trail or game camera and other devices regulation. Um, our department, along with a lot of Midwest public lands working groups, have been discussing this topic for several years now. As a, it's an ever-growing issue on on public properties throughout the Midwest. Um, seeing a lot of properties inundated with with these trail cameras, and and it's kind of transitioned from devices to actually view wildlife to devices to spy on who's in the, using the same property. Um, a rise in reports of theft of these trail cameras, misuse of the trail cameras, um, inundating pro, you know, tracks of wildlife areas, uh, monopolizing tracks of wildlife areas with a, a one individual's uh, trail cameras. So, and also staff in the Midwest Working Group also discussed the fair chase, fair chase issues um, under the, the North American model of wildlife conservation. So we're proposing that all trail cameras um, be prohibited on department lands. Um, and part of this too would include the use of, use images of wildlife produced or transmitted from satellite um, imagery as well so that people couldn't get real time live shots of wildlife on a wildlife ferry with a handheld device or anything like that. This would not preclude, preclude, preclude the use of mapping systems like Google Maps, Onyx Maps, things like that, that hunters uh, use a lot of. So, and again, this would also apply to Weehaw and iWeehaw properties. Um, so with that, I'd stand for any questions on the trail cam regulation. Any questions for Stuart on that? Okay. Is this number one? For workshop? Yes. This is number three, two. Number three, two? Okay. Yep. This is going to get workshop death. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, moving on to KR 115 8-1. Um, this is Department of Lands and Waters, and where our public lands reference document uh, falls under. I'll just quickly go over the, the different sections and subsections that we're proposing to, to amend. Uh, the first one under uh, access restrictions. I'd mentioned in previous meetings that we had entertained the idea of possibly implementing a 5 a.m. Um, can't get into the into the re, into the water you know, on the bottoms before 5 a.m. Similar to what you all passed at Neosho a year ago, and staff there at the bottoms um, met and discussed that numerous occasions, and they felt like because of the the construction that the bottoms is under, the the presence of whooping cranes last year and dry pools. They really didn't get a good uh, handle on the, the boating regulations and restrictions that you guys passed there to see if that helped with some of the issues that we were facing. So they, they chose to just have no recommendations at this time on that access restriction. Um, under the refuge uh, section here, the only change is under region three, Cherokee lowlands wildlife area and I apologize, I forgot to include the map that I provided you at the last workshop session this round. But now that we've we've acquired additional acreage down there through NERDA donations, um, we feel like we have enough acreage that a, a refuge portion is designated like all of our other wildlife areas. 
so that would be the Perkins East and the Bogner Center tracks. And at the next meeting, I will bring maps to, to remind you where those specific tracks are. And then under the daily hunt permits section, um, we've been discussing this for quite some time too. And, and we decided now that we're that we've transitioned to the Brandt licensing system that now would be an optimum time to uh, have check-in and check-out requirements at all of our, our wildlife areas. Um, we've all seen the, how crucial the data that, that we've obtained for a lot of our wetland properties has been with many of the discussions we've had here at these commission meetings. Um, and so we made the decision that now's the time to to add all of our wildlife areas to the check-in and check-out Brandt process. And, but for now, this would just be for hunting activity only. Um, once we get rolling with Brandt, um, we'll have the capabilities in the future to kind of adjust things as we see fit for management purposes. But for now, uh, just getting these, these wildlife areas all on board with the Brandt check-in and check-out is what we're recommending. This is all areas, not just the ones that have been out uh, uh, deleted. Correct. We before we just listed all the properties where I sportsman was required. We lined through all those properties and just um, added the language that all department managed lands and waters, wildlife areas, and state fishing lakes will require it. And I we all. Any other questions for Stuart? Well, we'll see you back here in a month to workshop this again. Yeah, lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to mention this came up at the commission meeting in Beloit and we had some internal conversations about our special hunts program and whether non-residents were allowed to participate in those. And up until this point, they have been uh, allowed to, to participate and apply. Um, but after surveying all the staff involved with these special hunts and talking with administration, um, we've made the, the decision that starting in, for this fall and winter, 22, 23 hunts, that 75 to 80% 80, 80 of them will be restricted to Kansas applicants only. Um, there'll still be a, that small portion that'll be open to everybody. Um, some staff felt pretty strongly, especially here in the East, that if we close those hunts down to non-residents, we won't get anybody apply because historically that's predominantly been their applicants as non-residents. So we want to try out this, um, see how participation goes. We're really going to, I've talked to Tana and, and we want to really make a good public re uh, release campaign to make sure that Kansas residents know that this is the decision we've made and that these hunts are available. And we, we encourage Kansas residents to participate. One thing that staff did indicate to me that we're gonna monitor is they felt like our local Kansas residents are more inclined to not show up to a hunt that they've drawn. They don't have as much vested interest as a non-resident who's driven from out of state, spent the time, spent the money. They're gonna show up to our hunts where it's easier for a local to say, ah, I got a ball game to go to, I can't make it. And so then we have an unfilled, unused hunt. So. We felt and staff felt like this was a, a worthy endeavor to try. And so that's that's the direction we're going for the 23 or 22 and 23 fall and winter hunts. And we're hoping to to get those posted online, I believe, Jason, around July 9th, 8th, 9th time period. And there'll be um, specific highlighted instructions that this change is occurring for this uh, special hunt program year. So. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention too, and I mentioned it this morning, but at the, at the Beloit Commission meeting, I mentioned that staff at this time don't have any uh, specific recommendations when it comes to the non-resident waterfowl hunting issue on, on public wetlands, but rest assured that the conversation has not stopped and will not stop. Um, we, it's, it's the hot topic still in our division, and my goal is to continue to look into things and and have some, some definitive paths kind of lined out. If, if staff do come to me with recommendations, we'll know which way to go, whether it be through the regulate, regulatory process or the Kansas statute through the legislative process. So we'll, we're continuing to discuss public meetings. We're gonna be having a public information night at Cheyenne Bottoms mid-August that everybody I encourage them to, to come to. We're uh, discussing other public meetings. We're, we're still talking about the survey 
through Rich's shop on the, on the human dimension side of things. So I just wanted to reiterate um, that, that we're still actively talking about this and, and um, will continue to do so in the future. So with that, I'd stand for any last questions. Any more questions? I appreciate the opportunities for the Kansas residents on those special hunts. Um, can you do a leftover draw allowing non-residents in if you don't fill them with Kansas residents? So, yeah, uh, Commissioner Sell, um, we already have that process in place where we, we do a first draw. I can't remember, Jason, when's our first draw? Um, it's in... August. August. It's in early August for that September, se September, October seasons. And then, then we'll do a November draw. We do a November draw in October for the Duke November December seasons, and then we'll have a draw in late December for January uh, hunts. It was determined last year that, um, or a couple of years ago, when we did the January hunts first, or had January hunts for deer combined with the winter hunts, we were having so many people. Um, drawing for those hunts that were getting their deer in December mm -hmm. during rifle season. So they were pulling out of that. So that's why we moved that back. So it's after that last, that firearm season, they did can determine that um, after a hunt is drawn for, uh, we list all the leftovers that didn't have people in them um, on the website and they can just call those managers and take those off the list. And then as people decline the hunts, um, uh, Scott Thomason and his team um, add those back to that list or they go to the next person drawn depending on what hunt it is. Okay. And we've also had initial conversations too about possibly putting the, the special hunts program into the Brant system um, in the future too. Um, so that would that would really make things more efficient and, and reporting and tracking. And so that's, that's another facet of, of this program that we're looking into as well. Okay, any more questions for Stuart? Yeah, Thank Commissioner you. Spore. Stuart, go ahead. What go about ahead. youth mentor areas? Are they uh, residents only, or are you still allowing non residents in the youth mentor areas? I'm sorry, Mr. Spore, I, I, you kind of cut out. I didn't catch all of that. What about youth mentor areas? As far as non-residents and residents on youth mentor areas. Oh, okay. Um, I believe that that was not discussed as of yet. And I, for this upcoming fall, I have not had the request for any of those to be restricted to residents only. We, we talked about it at the Beloit meeting. Right. I, I'm certain. saying my staff. Correct. My staff hasn't made that recommendation to restrict those youth mentor youth mentor areas to only Kansas Kansas residents at this time. Right. The the, the use is fairly low on a lot of those areas, um, and so we want to we want to try the special hunts program and see how that goes as well. Um, but th these are all part of the conversations we continue to have. Yeah, and in, in the area where I'm at. It's highly used by non-residents uh, in, in the area I'm at. So I don't know where, where the area you're talking about, but the areas that I watch and monitor is used more by non-residents than it is residents. Is, is that at Cedar Bluff? That's just in Western Kansas. Okay. Western reservoirs. Well, I'll circle back with staff and have that conversation with, with, Region one North staff about that issue. Thank you. Any other questions for Stuart? Okay. Thank you. Levi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Levi Jasper, Emporia, Kansas. Um, so First thing I have tonight is KAR 115-25-9A, uh, which is our uh, deer seasons and bag limits on our military subunits. Um, typically we vote on this at this meeting um, with the 
differences or things going on with regulations. Um, we're going to workshop this a third time. I think, are we going to get this one in Should August? August? Should be in August. Um, so this just sets uh, season dates uh, and bag limits with those subunits, uh, working with them to try and uh, help them meet their mission needs, but also to uh, allow some additional opportunity to hunt and for hunters to access those properties. Uh, so Smoky Hill uh, just requests basically the same as statewide seasons uh, set in 115-25-9. Uh, and then they want the uh, five whitetail antlers only permits on their subunit, which is the same as the subunit they're in, or the the DMU that they're in uh, for. Fort Riley, uh, they want additional days for authorized individuals, uh, September 1st through September 11th, so prior to uh, the youth and disabled season. And, the, and then from January 1st to January 31st. Um, and then, uh, they'll have additional days for that designated persons, uh, youth and dis people with disabilities from October 8th through October 10th, uh, which will replace the pre rep firearm season for antlerless white tailed deer, uh, which they will not have. Uh, firearm season dates are November 25th through November 27th, December 17th through December 23rd, and December 26th through December 27th. Um, same number of days as the statewide season, just rearranged when they're available. Um, but that also can give uh, some of our hunters additional dates to uh, firearm hunt uh, beyond our state regular statewide season too. Uh, and then they are not going to participate in the antlerless season in January um, and only allow, and they'd like to only allow one antlerless deer permit. That then takes us to Fort Leavenworth um their uh, variation from our statewide seasons include uh, open firearm seasons on november 12th through november 13th november 19th through november 20th november 24th through november 27th december 3rd through december 4th and december 10th through december 11th well, again same number of days just rearranged when they're uh, used and then they will they would like to be in the longest extended season uh, which is january 1st through january 22nd of 2023 uh, and then also participate in the extended archery season um, from january 23rd through january 31st for antlerless white-tailed deer and then they will uh, they want to be able to use their uh, five antlerless only permits on uh, their subunit 10A. Uh, and so with that, that's the recommended uh, military subunit dates and bag limits. Any questions for Levi? Let's move on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next one I have is KR 115-4-11, uh, which is big game wild turkey permit applications. Um, I think this is workshop number 432 or something like that. Uh, I think we started uh, last fall with this, um, but this will not go into effect this year with the draw already over and be implemented for next year's draw. Um, and so uh, we've had issues where we're concerned about point creep. Um, last several years, we're seeing significant increases in pronghorn hunting applications um, also with people uh, purchasing archery permits. And so uh, last year, or last few years, we've reduced um, the uh, limited draw permits by about 20% for last year. Um, currently it's taking about six preference points to obtain a firearms permit to hunt uh, pronghorn. And uh, one of the things that can happen is that a hunter can apply for that limited firearms permit, uh, not draw and get a preference point, and then still buy an over-the-counter archery tag. So that's uh, increasing the uh, 
preference points needed over time. Um, and so with that increase in popularity of archery hunting for pronghorn, um, we'd like to remove the ability to get a preference point if you also get a archer or get a archery permit. So you can either apply for the limited permit and get and take that permit if you receive it or take a preference point and not get to hunt pronghorn that year, or you can give up that preference point if you did uh, submit an application uh, and get an archery tag. Um, and so just addressing that ability to double dip, um, you can see some of the increase in applications and permits uh, there um, and how that's affected uh, permits and harvest over time. Um, so again, the recommendation here is to modify this regulation so that prong hunters must either get an archery permit or apply for a limited draw permit. They would not be able to apply for the firearm or muzzleloader permit or buy a preference point and also purchase an archery permit during the same season. Any question for Levi? Well, you're up next for the public hearing. The, uh, so for uh, public hearing tonight, uh, it's 115-4-6, uh, which is our deer management units. Um, here, what we need to do is just clean up some uh, boundaries, uh, specifically under uh, section E, the Pawnee unit five, um, a, the uh, K-14 was, had some work done. They've uh, built a different section, taking it um, on a different route. And so it moved the boundary of the unit. Um, and so all this does is uh, clarify the road names so that the boundary stays where it had been. Um, so specifically, uh, it's the junction of uh, Sego Road and then south on that to its junction with US 50 after when it changes from K14 to Sego Road. And then uh, that then also affects the, uh, in section F, the middle Arkansas unit number six. Uh, and so that's that Sego Road and then north on Sego Road to extension K14. Um, just basically uh, because of the name, the rerouting of K14 just changes that name. And then um, additionally, on section K, which is the Osage Prairie Unit 11. Uh, last year, uh, we recently, we changed the, two years ago, we changed the boundary uh, for the Unit 19 uh, zone. And that then affected Unit 11. Um, and so uh, this is just clarifying that uh, Highway K-150 is no longer, uh, it's now Johnson County 135th Street. It's no longer Highway K-150. And so when we made the change previously in the other units, we did not uh, get that language change for Unit 11, so that shared boundary. Um, this is just clarifying the actual street name since it is no longer that name. Um, and so that would be the changes for the DMU uh, unit boundaries, just cleaning up the names so that they're clear of where, what roads are. Any boundary. question for Levi? Not, I would like a motion that we, that we accept these changes. Commissioner Sill, I so move. Commissioner Asperino, I second been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion? <laughs> Sheila? Commissioner Cross? Yes. Commissioner Escarino? Yes. Commissioner Gefeller? Yes. Commissioner Ryder? Yes. Commissioner Sill? Yes. Commissioner Spohr? Yes. yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Half seven zero. Thank you, Levi. Thank you. Linda?
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission and the visiting public. Jason, do you have a PowerPoint ready for me? Real quickly, I'm gonna give you a quick update on our FEMA damage and what we've done so far. It won't take long, I promise. Okay, so um, you, you, it, 2019 was historical flooding. Uh, that was Perry State Park right there. And so um, I just wanna go over a few things that I thought you might find interesting uh, to watch. I'll let you click it. Try it out. Okay, so um, it was historic flooding. 17 state parks were um, underwater at record high levels and those state parks were closed at some capacity for about four to six months. Uh, the damage to our state park facilities was in the millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Next slide there, Jason. That's, go back one slide. That's Hillsdale. And it was one of our most significant damaged in, this, in four campgrounds. So that, that state park was closed for quite a while. And as you know, that's one of our biggest state parks most visited. And so we, chose to work on that one first to redo all the campgrounds that were damaged electrical water we're still working on it and we still have a little left to do and i think we're about 1.3 million uh spent there today next slide there jason so just kind of some interesting stats 240 uh 2438 campsites were damaged uh we had 242 facilities closed we have 33 miles of roads that's been damaged and we, on average, they were, those state park facilities were closed four to six months, some a little bit more than that. Next slide. And so what we did is when, when it, the water started coming up, we decided to uh, protect as much assets as we could. Those were the cabins at Hillsdale down at River Pond area. Although that didn't flood, we went ahead and chose to move those out of there because it was close. So uh, what happens is if it, blocks the road, then we're stuck. So we went ahead and moved those out early and got them to higher ground and we're able to move them back in. But the, the damage to those, if they'd have gotten wet, would have been much more than us moving those out of there. So uh, we were able to get those set back in there and just to save our assets that way. We did that on a couple locations. Cross Timber Fall River did have some damage in their cabins though. And we got those aired out and fixed and back uh, open for reservations. So to date, uh, we've spent over 3.8 million. The governor put in her budget uh, 2 million for state general fund, which we've never, we haven't used before. Uh, we've spent that as you can see, plus more of our park fee fund and our road funds. That, um, new, sh that new shower building right there is at Eisenhower State Park. The uh, building there was completely damaged and over underwater. So we've moved this one on the other side of the road to mitigate it, the damage is there, and that one is complete. We still have some uh, damage at Eisenhower and Pomona to do, but that is one of the completed shower buildings we put in. And the next slide, okay. So we still have about $9.5 million to, to fix. And that number has gone up because cost of, cost of materials has gone up. And so when we first estimated those, and as you get into it, like at uh, El Dorado and places like that, you don't know how much damage you have until people start using them. And of course, right after that, we had COVID, and so people came. And so we started the summer band and the summer band and the summer in our campground. So we're still uh, trying to fix that. And I'll just give you a perspective here. Milford, we just uh, put that uh, Cedar Point campground out to bid, and that came back at $2 million. So that's significantly higher than the engineer's estimate, but it's your cost of materials now. We have about 2.8 million we still need to do at Canopolis. Um, another big one, that, that at Hillsdale, we'll, we'll spend probably over 1.5 million just at Hillsdale alone. So um, I think our team's done a fantastic job um, pulling our assets together, do a lot of it themselves, but a lot of it we did, we have our user engineers in the agency and we bid it out, but um, we got back up and going. And so we have another slide, don't I? Okay, so just as a perspective, 2019, our visitation was uh, low, 5.6 million. Uh, revenue was at 8.4 million. 
2020, when COVID hit, look at the jump. We went to the highest visitation we've had ever in Kansas State Parks at 8.6 million. And then uh, revenue is 11 million. And then 2021, we're almost 14 million in revenue. Visitation's down a little bit. People were staying a little bit longer when they come uh, just to have a place to go for COVID purposes. And so I feel like um, our team has done fantastic accommodating, uh, moving people around and getting our facilities back open. Um, so that's just kind of a perspective. And, and in doing that, that's when I'll, uh, is there one more slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. So that's Elk City State Park. That's a new fishing dock that was put in with FEMA, uh, with intentions for FEMA reimbursement. You can see what it, the damaged one looks like to the left and then to the right is the new one. Um, I was down there at Memorial Weekend and people, it's flooded there again, but you can believe the number of people want to get out on that uh, fishing dock. So. It's been pretty good for us. We're working still on it. We're not there. We're not, um, we're not where we need to be, but uh, we continue to um, submit into FEMA. We've received no FEMA dollars back. So with that said, our intention is to get our reimbursement back from FEMA and then start on the next phase of projects. We can't do it until we get some of that reimbursement back. And so. Mr. Chair, I might ask Linda to clarify a little more. So. In the past, did we ever have this kind of delay with FEMA? And secondarily, um, do you have any projection from them on when that money will come? It's always a long process. Um, we have submitted our debris removal, which is 100% reimbursable. Still don't have it done. I believe part of it is secretary because of COVID. Uh, they couldn't get out to see the progress of it, um, but it is a long process. And so um, I don't necessarily blame them. It's just a process to go through. Um, in the past, I've been through this before and it, it does take a while to get reimbursed. So I'm anticipating to get reimbursed for the, the debris removal, which you know we did that right at the get-go. Um, and then these other projects, they'll have to come out and see and tour and with our engineers help to make sure we did everything right. There's a process and so we've, you can't just go in there and do whatever you want. You got to make sure you put it back the way it was, or or if you mitigate it, we have to make sure that we pay for the difference if we mitigate it out of the water and that kind of thing. So um, it takes a it's a long process, and I th feel like our engineers and our staffs done a good job trying to get things going. It's not as fast as what the Corps done. I hear the Corps of Engineers has uh, improved a lot of their areas quicker, but they. I think they have more access to money than what we did. So I'm grateful the two million, two million we got from state general fund that got us going. Hopefully we can get the reimbursements to start on the next phase of projects. So uh, that's where we're at. It's kind of interesting though, to see uh, what we've been doing and, and how the progress, the number of people we hosted right after that. I think that's pretty incredible. So with that said, um, I'll take any questions on that. You're always welcome to come visit a state park, by the way. Uh, team is always glad to have you there. We're, again, the trend is not quite as much as it was in 2020, 2021, but we're still busy. And so um, anyway, I want to now talk to you about the cabins. And I, I'm going to let you pass that down. And I have a question, Commissioner Escarino. Um, the, the new showers, restrooms, whatever that, that are being built, is there ventilation in those? I've had a complaint about how hot it is when it's extremely hot outside and there's no air circulation on, in there. Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on which one they're looking at. We have several styles uh, of shower facilities. We've been trying to go more towards the uh, CXD. They do have a vent, but it's probably not as like our, you know, of course our open air and some of our uh, cat, our shower buildings that were block style had, mm -hmm. they're all really almost open. Yeah. And so our, we've gone to the CXT or the huff cut style because it has a family unit. And so it does, isn't male or female. So it's a four pod or six pod and, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it can get hot in there at, at times, depending on how much it's used, certainly. Okay. So that's just a recommendation that I've had it, from a, vent, into a better vent in it. Yeah. I think we put in the bid this time that the windows could be opened. So that might help. Thank and, you. And before it wasn't. So. All right. Thank you. Sure. Good. Thanks for bringing that up. 
Okay, so um, let's talk about cabins a little bit. We, again, love our cabins. Uh, a lot of people, we found out the public loves our cabins. Um, Cheney State Park is a little bit different breed on cabins. The Friends Group there um, pays for and operates these cabins. They run through a reservation system, but they pay for the utilities, they pay for uh, any, any cleaning and upkeep they pay for. We just put three new cabins in there and we, during right before COVID or right during COVID, we uh, dedicated those three cabins on the east side. They were stick built. The cost to put those three cabins in were significant higher than the cabins we've done in the past, over 100,000 each. The friends group uh, took out the note for that. And so in doing that, they wanted to increase their fees so they can start getting that paid down. Um, cabins are great, but the cost to run them can be tough on us, uh, utilities and cleaning them. In our state park system, we usually have, I try to get a camp host to clean them, but we're not always um, able to do that. We have to pay seasonal staff to help clean those cabins. So um, I visited with the Cheney Friends Group. I told them I'd come and, and present to you what they would like them to go to. The smaller cabins you'll see on your sheet let me show you this. Uh, this the smaller uh, cabins are the 65 a night. They want to go to 75 a night, uh, Sunday through Thursday. And then they have two other style cabins on the west side that are at the 95. They want to go to 110. And then those new cabins on the east side that were stick built, they want to go to 140 a night. Uh, and then on Friday, Saturday nights, um, the rates would go to the smaller cabins, 85, then the, then the two bedrooms to 120, and then the three new cabins to 150, or the, uh, 165, 150. Sorry, I was looking at current rate. $100, 150, uh, and then 165 a night for those three new cabins on the east side. And then we have weekly rates that if, if people want to rent, rent them out for weekly, it don't happen often, but we put them in there at a discounted rate also. In addition to that, the state fair cabin is costing them more to um, operate also. We do a lot of the, we, we put that cabin in there for, for the Kansas State Fair. We use it for our purposes during the fair, but we let it rent out at other times. And the state fair gets a 50% uh, cut of this, and it's costing them more, just like ours would be, uh, utilities and cleaning it. Uh, we do any of the major maintenance on it, but it's still costing them more. So we want to go up to 95 and 120 uh, on the weekends mm -hmm. for the uh, Kansas State Fair cabin. So now with that, I would take any questions. Do they say, what's it like seasonally? Um... So then three new cabins at Cheney. It's a good question, uh, Commissioner Sill. Um, they are at uh, over 80% on weekend. Uh, it's hard to get in year round uh, year round it is it's tough to get in those uh they're at 80 percent occupancy the other ones are not that high um i think around 50 percent is a year round average some a little lower those those smaller cabins were the ones we put in i remember uh in the early 2000s and we matched that with the grant and the friends group came up with the match and so it's, those are smaller, uh, people like those larger cabins and those new cabins on the east side are really uh, right there by the marina, it's close to the water, close to the boat ramp. They're very, very popular. We could use probably five more of those. But they, the, uh, the state fair cabin's not, uh, it's just a, it's a matter of too expensive, it's costing them too much to maintain that. Any questions on any of these for Linda? Who builds the cabins? Who who? So the the three cabins at Cheney that were just put in was a contractor went out to bid. Okay. Um, the other cabins we had the prison build some, and we are having cabins now being built by Neosho Community College, and so they have built uh, five, six, probably eight cabins for us, and they're they're doing a fantastic job. So it's through their student program. And they build us one a year and we have a contract with them. Um, and then the very early cabins we purchased through Skyline, like a mobile home, it's on a chassis. And that's what some of those cabins are at Perry and at Cheney and some of those areas. Um, Fort Hay State has a pretty good program, carpenter program to 
probably you should take a look at uh, consider that we'll do that because it's it's been a, a favorable program for us with the community mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. and so um, i've even had some high schools reach out to us mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a great program for them and especially when we go down connor sitting in the audiences um went down to look at the neosho community college those students are, are very proud of what they've done oh, yeah. and come and visit it so it's kind of neat program for us for sure. Thanks for mm -hmm. uh, mentioning that. Okay, we have a recommendation. Uh, I'd like a motion that we approve it. We don't need to vote. Oh. We don't need to vote on this one. So. No, we normally don't, we tell you. Hey, I, I was thinking since this workshop, we were voting on, I mean, public hearing, we are voting right. on these numbers. Then is there any more questions for Linda? I'll like make one more st statement. Uh, Mr. Ryder, thank you for your support of Kansas State Parks. Our team uh, enjoyed you and your family coming out using our cabins and camp and use our trails. And you've always visited with them and they truly appreciate it. So thank you for what you've done for Kansas State Parks. Well, thank you. We've had a great time. And we'll continue. Yes, mm -hmm. please. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, that concludes the agenda for today. Uh, do we have a, what's the date of the September meeting? It is um, September 8th in Chanute. And I'm yeah. working, I'm hoping Neosho County Community College, but I haven't got it cemented down yet. And I'll let you know as soon as I do. We do need to set a November and a January date, I believe, so that we have them on file. Do we want to set the November date sort of contemporaneous with the governor's hunt? I believe we do, but probably that day before. Yes. So is that the 14th? What is that date of the governor's hunt? I think it'd be the week after, wouldn't it? Yeah, the Thursday would be the no, 17th. Thursday, it's, 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 What's the date, Troy? 17. 17th. 17th. So that's Friday, the 17th? Thursday. So we would have to meet Thursday. It's 17th. Thursday, Thursday, the 17th is the date we'd have the commission meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want Kobe or Oakley? In I place mean, the Oakley. governor's hunts in Kobe, in correct? Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone to Oakley the last two years. We can do that's Kobe. why I say any Kobe. place that's Oakley. Oakley. Oh, okay. We can go to Kobe this time since it's it's actually in Kobe. So. I'll find a place in Kobe. What was that date? What was that date? November 17th, correct? I don't have calendars. And then January, do we want the second? Second, last year was the 10th. So whatever is closest to the 10th, the Thursday closest to the 10th. So January 12th, possibly then. Yeah. Do we want a location? Do we want to go liberal, maybe that direction? When is our meeting in Topeka? March. And March. I think when's the last to... time we've been in Wichita? Last year in that April? last year. It was yeah. The last, last year time. in April, I think. Just... I mean, I don't have that in front of me right now either, but I think it was in June. June? Was it? I mean, maybe it was in June last year. I was a year ago now. Wichita. So January 12th, Wichita? Mm hmm Okay. Yes, <laughs> August 4th. Okay. It's on August the... fourth. Hutchinson. Hutchinson. Yeah, August 4th in Hutchinson at the Dillon Nature Center. I have one other item I'd like to consider and we can discuss it at the next meeting. We've been having more after, after 6.30 than we used to. We want to consider keeping the afternoon schedule a little lighter and having the evening session begin to start at six o'clock instead of six thirty. You can all think about that, and we'll bring it up again at the next meeting. Yeah, this is Commissioner Spore. This is Commissioner Spore. Uh, 
I, I would make a proposal. We, we, our, our afternoon session was three hours and the evening session was an hour and a half. What would be wrong with starting at 10 to noon and finishing up one to three and everybody could still get home by dark? That would be fine with me. The, the biggest difficulty I can see is that we try to have an evening session so that people are in the area and want to come and make a presentation or come personally. It would be uh, they could do it when they didn't have to go to work. And I think that's the reason it started. I'm not saying it has to remain that way. Well, I would, I would recommend the change uh, for, for just ease of travel, the lack of having to get overnight travel. Everybody can get to a location usually by 10 o'clock. And then obviously we could get home by dark. It sure makes a lot of sense to me. But of course, a lot of things make sense to me that don't work. Like I'd like for, I, I think we should consider that. I'd like for staff to look into it and make some recommendations too. Thank you, Troy. Are there any other questions to come before the group? Meeting adjourned.